in the last 500 years. In the last 500 years, Filipinos have fought for freedom, unity, and equality. We have made our mark in many fields, from science and medicine to culture and the arts. We are beacons of creativity, resourcefulness, resiliency, and compassion. In 2021, the Filipino people will join the world in commemorating one of the greatest achievements of mankind. The first circumnavigation of the world. We celebrate this historic achievement by bannering an important message. Over adversity and struggles, we shall triumph. Putting humanity first. Always. The Chief Executive on the Road, the exclusive virtual tour of the Presidential Car Museum.
Tumayong buong tapang harapin ang buhay at kapin ang tagumpay. Tulungan ang kapwa at bigyang halaga huwag hatakin. Isipin huwag sana ang sarili lang pakisama't bayanihan. Subukan natin isulong at ligawan ang magandang bukas. Ikaw at ako magkasama tayo sa lubungin ng kinabukasan. Abutin natin ang tagumpay Patuloy lang tayo sa pagpapanday Tiwala sa Diyos ang sandat at gabay Subukan natin isulong at ligawan ang Magandang bukas, ikaw at ako Magkasama tayo sa lubungin ang kinabukasan Si Roman Villame, 
na mas kilala sa tawag na Yoyoy ang siya na sigurong pinaka na nagpakilala sa mga Pilipino sa kwento ni Magallanes at Lapu-Lapu. Pumatok ang awiting Magellan ng dating konduktor mula sa buhol na sinulat at inawit niya noong 1972. Halina at balikan natin ang tunay na kwento sa likod ng awit ni Yoyoy Villame ngayong Quincentenario. March 16, When Philippines was discovered by Magellan They were sailing the night across the big ocean Until they saw a small Limasawa island Magellan landed in Limasawa at noon The people met him very well, come on the shore They did not understand the speaking they have done Because Castilla get at waray waray man When Magellan landed in Cebu City Raha Hello, po sa ating lahat ng mga nakikinig, nanonood mula sa Luzon, Visayas at Mindanao. Isa pong magandang umaga, maulan na umaga ngayong araw na ito. At uh, gayon pa man, sa kabila ng ating mga nararanasang ulan, tuloy pa rin ang ating uh, aktividad uh, para sa ating uh, promosyon ng ating uh, kasaysayan. Ito po ang 5th uh, LHCN Webinar Series. At sa umagang to ang tema natin ay Remembering the Philippine Spanish Heritage. No? At uh, ito po ay um, sa pakikipagtulungan sa, of course, uh, host ng National Historical Commission of the Philippines through NPUC o National Quincentennial uh, Celebration, ang Local History Committees Network, syempre ang uh, Cavite Study Center ng De La Salle University of Marinas, at kasama natin ang National Commission for Culture and the Arts, kapisana ng mga bahansaliksikan sa bansa o kabansa, ang Philippine Historical Association Society. At sa umagang ko ito ay uh, tayo po ay uh, live stream no, sa sa uh, FB pages ng NHCP and QC ng DFA ng DepEd uh, at ng um, of course, ng, ng, ano, no, ng uh, Community Study Center. So marami pong nanonood sa atin ngayon. At napakaganda po ng ating pag-uusapan. Kasi nung pong mga nakaraang buwan, um, nung June, syempre, nakafocus sa independence. No? Nung, June, nung July at August, tinalakay natin yung historiography. Uh, nung nakaraang September, marami rin nanonood noon. No? Marami interested about cultural mapping because ang ating topic ay cultural heritage. No? And... This month po, October, ay, uh, ang uh, focus natin ay Philippine Spanish uh, Heritage. No? At uh, napaka-importante po nito. Alam na, alam po natin, meron tayong tatlong strand ng Philippine history. No? 
Kasi no, uh, kung matatanda natin, bago dumating mga Kastila, bago tayo maging Christian country, ika nga, ay na, meron na tayo mga indigenous communities, meron tayong mga eh, different ethnic communities, at meron tayong uh, the, the Muslim, the mga Muslims. No? So nung dumating ang mga Espanyol, nagkaroon tayo ng panibagong uh, uh, track no? ng ating kasaysayan, which is the Christian track. Kaya nga kung titignan natin, tatlo yung track eh, no? Uh, ang tanong nga kasi dyan, bakit meron pang mga ethnic community ang merong mga sakop ng, ng mga Kristiyano. Kaya yung kultura nila namayari hanggang sa ngayon. So ito yung mga non-Christian communities. No? Then aside from that, sa, sa Mindanao, alam din natin na namayani yung kultura ng Muslim. Sapagkat hindi naman lahat ay nasakop ng, uh, na, no, ng Kristiyano. Kaya yun siguro bilang mga Pilipino, no, lalo na nakafocus tayo sa national identity, uh, our objective is to harmonize all these things. Kasi ang ating cultural identity, which is our national identity, composed of different cultures. No? Kaya yan po ay, uh, at ngayong ubaga na ito, pag-uusapan natin yung, uh, yung track ng uh, uh, Spanish heritage sa Pilipinas. Hindi natin may iwasan yan, part po yan, at uh, isa yan sa mga sila-celebrate natin ngayon, ang 500 years of Spanish presence in, uh, uh, in the Philippines. No? So, simulan na po natin. Ang ating pong programa ay... Uh, Uh, magsisimula sa national, tulad ng dati, national anthem. Uh, pangalawa ay um, ang ating uh, prayer. No? At ang pangatlo ay ang ating uh, Cavite. Dahil po ang ating po project ay sponsored ng uh, course ng province of Cavite through the Cavite Study Center. So, inaanyayahan po natin lahat ng uh, nanonood na tumayo para magbigay galang sa ating bandila. Maraming salamat po.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فقال ربكم ادعوني أستجب لكم آمين يا رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين هدينا سرات المستقيم سرات الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضال آمين اللهم اجمع شامل المسلمين وكريستيان ولوما في مدينة دباو وسلم دائما مجتمعنا هذا بسلم والأمن والتقدم في بلدنا هذا آمين يا رب العالمين ربنا لا تجيغ قدوبنا بعد جهدتنا وهب لنا من لدن رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا أتينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على خير خلقه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة ما يسيبون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today to praise and worship you and give you thanks for all the things you continue to provide for ourselves and our families. Father, we humbly ask for forgiveness for all the times we have offended you. When we forget to acknowledge your presence in the image of our brothers and sisters, and for moments we fail to be good stewards of the blessings you have given us. Continue to guide and protect each one of us, Lord, that we may always walk in the light of your everlasting love and mercy. Grant us, Father, with your comfort in times of distress and with your strength in times of weakness. Bestow upon us your unending grace and healing, that me, me in turn become instruments of gentleness and compassion to others. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with the prayer and intercession of our Blessed Mother. Amen.
fifth uh, LHC and webinar series. Ang tema ay remembering the Philippine Spanish heritage at ito po ay uh, sponsored ng uh, National Historical Commission uh, through the National Quincentennial Celebration ng Cavite Study Center ng De La Salle University Las Marinas at syempre kagapay ang uh, NCCA, ang uh, Kabansa, ang PHA, ang uh, Taglakenyo Study Center, ang Bacoor Study Center, Palawan Study Center, Bacoor Historical Society at ang Cavite Historical Society. At uh, bilang formal na buksan ng ating programa ay uh, inaanyahan po natin si uh, Mr. Alvin Ilc, ang, ang OIC Deputy Executive Director for Programs and Projects po ng National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Uh, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Um, sa ngalan po ng Pambansang Komisyong Pangkasaysayan ng Pilipinas ay maglugod ko pong pinasasalamatan ang masipag naming Commissioner, Dr. Emmanuel Franco Calairo. Sir Manny, siya din po ang kasalukuyang Pangulo ng Local Historical Committees Network o LHCN. Gayun din po maraming salamat sa De La Salle University Das Marinas, Cavite Studies Center, at sa lahat po ng ating mga partner na mga iba't ibang samahang uh, pangkasaysayan no na most of them are members also of ng ating LHCN uh, sa pag-organize po nitong ating webinar ang um, kung hindi po ako nagkakamali ikalima na po ito sinimulan nung Hulyo and I think it will continue until next year uh, ganun din po uh, nais kong pasalamatan ang ating mga kasama ngayong umaga sa pagpapaunlak ng kanilang panahon at pagbabahagi ng kaalaman Kay Ma'am Dr. Maria Luisa Kamagay, Ma'am Malu, maraming salamat po. Uh, thank you. Kay Dr. Francis Navarro, Sir Chas, good morning. Long time, no see. <laughs> good morning. Salamat. Sir Chas, salamat. Later on, makakasama din natin. I don't know if he's already here, si Director uh, Victorino Manalo. Si, siya rin po ay isang commissioner ng NHCP. Uh, uh, makakasama din po natin siya later on. At of course, kay, uh, kay Sir uh, Dr. Jose Andres Diaz. Sir Joe. Morning. Dr. Jose, good morning po. Uh, of course, nais ko pala pasalamatan din po ang ating mga LHCN members. I am sure na kikinig sila ngayon at nanonood sa ating Facebook at sa iba't ibang mga portals na ginagamit natin. Siyempre po, maraming salamat sa ating uh, LHCN Secretariat. Alam ko po, po kasi lagi silang nandyan para magbigay ng kanilang uh, uh, supportang technical dito sa, sa ating webinar. Um, for the fifth installment of the LHCN webinar series on sustaining the discussion on Philippine history and culture during the pandemic. The topic on, is on uh, remembering Philippine Spanish heritage. I am sure uh, every one of us knows what heritage is, but for today's webinar, I think the definition of the Center for Heritage and Society of the University of Massachusetts in Armhurst is more apt. No? The Center defines heritage as, as quote, the full range of our inherited traditions, monuments, objects, and culture. Most important, it is the range of contemporary activities, meanings, and behaviors that we draw from them." End quote. Going by this definition, we know that the Philippines inherited a lot of uh, tangible and intangible heritage from Spain, heritage which we uh, modified no, and adapted to become our own. Ilan sa mga iniingatan nating tangible heritage ay mga estruktura na impluensya ng Espanya gaya ng mga simbahan, mga bahay na bato, mga kuta, mga bantayan o mga watchtowers. No? Kung noon ito ay tinayo ayon sa kanilang mga gamit, ito naman ngayon ay ipilip natin inaalagaan at pinanatili ang kaanyuhan dahil ito ang mga patunay o larawan ng ating mayamang kasaysayan na sumasalamin sa ating kultura. Sa kabilang banda, Masasabi na mas maraming intangible no? ang minanan natin sa Espanya. Minsan nga, hindi na natin ito pinapansin dahil bahagi na ng ating pang-araw-araw na pamumuhay. Magmula sa ating paraan ng pagluluto at mga pagkain, sa ating mga pangalan, no? sa ating mga ginagamit na salita, sa ating mga tradisyon at ritual, at higit sa lahat sa ating paniniwala at relihiyon. Marahil isang dahilan kung bakit hindi natin nga napapansin ng mapamanang, is, ng mapamanang ito sa Pilipinas ay sapagkat uh, minsan kasi sa mga textbooks natin, mas nabibigyan din yung, yung mga abuses o yung mga pagmamalabis ng Espanya nung tayo sakop pa nila. Hindi naman ito sinasantabi sapagkat siyempre ito din naman ang naging dahilan o daan upang ating mga ninuto, ninuno at mga bayani ay uh, mag-alsa at pumiling magsarili at magkaroon ng isang malayang bansa. 
subalit uh, hindi natin maitatanggi na tunay na malalim ang ating koneksyon at ugnayan sa Espanya at bagi sila kung sino man tayo ngayon. Ang ating malalim at malawak na koneksyon sa Espanya ang dahilan kung bakit noong 2002 ay ipinanukala ni dating Senador Edgardo Angara na isabatas ang Republic Act 9187 o Philippine Spanish Friendship Day kung saan ang NHCP ang inatasan upang pangunahan ang pagpapatupad ng taras na ito. Sa kanyang mensahe noong 2010, sa ikawalong anibersaryo ng pagdiriwan ng PILS pa, sinabi niya, no, quote, 300 years of interaction between Spain and the Philippines have built enduring social structures upon which we define our identities and interests. Independence did not erase the, lie, the ties that had developed between our two countries. Our common culture, religion, and centuries-long history make it natural for a special affinity to exist, irrespective of changing political circumstances or separate development paths." End quote. In the coming years will be the milestone years for the Philippines. The 500 anniversaries of the first Easter Day Mass, the Battle of Mactan, the introduction of Christianity in the Philippines, and the first circumnavigation of the world. All of these events are tied with our historical and cultural connection with Spain. This long and historical cultural connection with Spain, of course, results in a wide range of topics regarding our Spanish heritage. No? Uh, dahil sa mahabang ugnayan natin sa si Espanya, ay maraming paksa ang pwedeng pag-usapan tungkol sa mga pamanang nakuha natin sa kanila. Ang mga paksang ito ay karaniwang ibinabahagi ng ating mga kasamang historiador ngayong umaga at mga eksperto uh, sa mga konferensya at symposium na karaniwang ginagawa ng NHCP o sinusuportahan ng NHCP sa mga nakalipas na taon sa iba't ibang universidad bago ang pandemya. Subalit dahil nga po sa hamon ng panahon, ito ngayon ay ginagawa natin online. Kahit mapalad po tayo dahil ang mga kasama natin sila at mapapakinggan ng libre. No? Kaya muli po, bilang pagtatapos, nais, nais kong pasalamatan si na Dr. Gamagay, Ma'am, si Sir Chas, Dr. Navarro, Commissioner Manalo, Sir Joe, uh, man, uh, sa paglalaan ng kanilang panahon at oras upang ipabahagi, ibahagi sa atin ng kanilang kaalaman sa mga paksang bahagi ng ating mayang maugnan <laughs> historical at cultural sa Espanya. Maraming salamat po. Uh, maraming salamat po sa Sir Alvin. Uh, napakalaking tulong ng... Uh, National Historical Commission, of course, uh, through the leadership of our uh, energetic chairman, no? Dr. Rene Escalante, and, and, uh, and the board members. No? At uh, patuloy po kami umaasa, tayo umaasa sa National Historical Commission. Tapakat sabi ko nga, uh, tayo lang itong commission ang merong makinarya para sa, sa pagpapalaganap talaga ng uh, kasaysayan ng ating uh, bansa. No? At uh, bahagi po ng man mandato ng National Historical Commission yung, yung link sa grassroots level. Kaya po kasama sa charter ng uh, National Historical Commission ay itong pagbuo po siguro magbigay sa atin ng uh, ng mga karanasan no at uh, ilang guide para sa mga gusto magbuo ng historical society ano ba yung mga proyekto ang uh, presidente ng uh, Bacoor Historical Society si uh, Dr. Jose Andres uh, Diaz sir magandang morning sa inyo good morning good morning And uh, greetings from the Bacoor Historical Society. Uh, we can safely say that the Philippines is a product of its Spanish heritage. From the name of the country, after King Philip of Spain, the names of its people from the order of Governor General Claveria to its major religion, customs and traditions, food and more. Well, the exchange of European, New World, and Asian goods and ideas. Bacoor, as a typical town, 
now a city, has been greatly influenced by Spain with its historic church where Catholic faith has been continuously observed, but also the site of revolutionary battles and the very venue for the true declaration of Philippine independence on August 1, 1898. Its history is much shaped by being an important part of the Hacienda de Imus and crops from the Americas and other Asian countries were introduced and propagated. As we celebrate the 500 years of introduction of Christianity and circumnavigation of the world in 2021, we find new information and realities that are influenced by our colonial past. One recent development is the Ifugao rice terraces, once believed to be pre-colonial, now proven to be the reaction of the once lowland dwelling Ifugaos to escape Spanish domination by moving into the remote mountains of the Cordilleras. Another is the Muslim Christian struggle based on slave raiding, long believed to be purely religious conflict, now presented as based on tradition and economic reasons. These new realizations and understanding of our Spanish heritage would be of great help in our continuing efforts toward nation building. Uh, Inaanyayahan ko po ang ating mga nakikinig, lalo na yung mga wala pang uh, historical societies. No po? Uh, pagtulungan po natin na maging uh, organized at uh, itaguyod ang uh, ating uh, kasaysayan ng ating mga lugar at maging miyembro ng uh, LHCN. Kasi sabi nga ng NHCP ay uh, Philippine history is local history. I would like to congratulate and give thanks to the organizers of this webinar, especially Dr. Manny Calairo, NHCP Commissioner, DLSUD Vice Chancellor, Director of Cavite Study Center, Cavite Historical Society President, and dear friend. Also to the involved institutions, the Local Historical Committees Network of the NHCP, the NCCA, Cabansa, Center for Tal Tarlaqueño Studies, Palawan Study Center, Cavite Study Center, and Cavite Historical Society. And to our distinguished speakers, mabuhay. Maraming salamat po, uh, Dr. Diaz. So, malaking role talaga ang uh, local studies. Kasi karaniwan po dun sa mga nababasa nating uh, uh, national history, especially mga textbook, it's basically an outline of uh, uh, national events, no? Pero ano ba yung nangyari sa mga local, uh, sa mga provinces and municipalities, no? So yan ang uh, objective ng ating uh, mga local historical societies to document no? and preserve our uh, uh, heritage. So maraming salamat po, Dr. Jose Andres Diaz, ang uh, presidente ng uh, Bacoor Historical uh, Society. So... Magandang umaga po muli at uh, punong-puno po ang ating uh, umaga ngayon dahil sa marami tayong mga speakers no na very specialist sa kanilang mga larangan no? At uh, ang, ang una nating pag-uusapan ay may kinalaman sa uh, Galio and Trans-Pacific Exchange. Alam niyo po, uh, mas kina ako noong una no pag sinabi na natin alam natin the Philippine na Spanish colonialism 333 years, di ba? Uh, yun ang karaniwang alam natin. Pero yun pala, uh, there was a time na ang, uh, ang link natin dahil where ang Pilipinas, ang, ano, ang uh, Mexico, ang Vice Royalty of Spain. No? So, nangyayari, karaniwan, ang talagang link natin, Mexico and Philippines, kaya Trans-Pacific, hindi eh, siya natin Trans-Atlantic, Trans-Pacific. No? Uh, so, uh, for so many years, ang, uh, ang link, ang direct link ay uh, Mexico, Manila, kaya Manila, Acapulco Trail, no? Uh, liban lamang nung uh, nag-declare na independence ang Mexico nung uh, late ni ano, mga 19th century na no? 1820s na nagkaroon ng direct link uh, sa ano no sa Spain. Kaya sabi nila out of that 333 years, ang 250 years is basically ay ang uh, Mexico ano no, uh, Manila no. So siguro magandang uh, may paliwanag para sa atin ng ating uh, ating um, speaker no so hindi ko na po magtatagalin isa pong uh, 
Well, kaibigan natin no, na ating speaker at uh, specialist po sa Philippine-Spanish uh, relation dati naging uh, chair ng Ateneo de Manila University Department of History at sa ngayon siya yung uh, ano no ang uh, chair ng uh, Philippine Academic Consortium for Latin American Studies at karaniwan po siyang kinukuha ng tagapagsalita sa National Quincentennial Celebrations ang tinutukoy ko po ay uh, walang iba kung si kundi si Dr. Francis M. Navarro uh, short for uh, Sir Chas Sir good morning po sa inyo Good morning, Dr. Talayo. Thank you very much. <laughs> you have the floor, here. sir. You have the floor. <laughs> ah, okay, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here uh, to, to, um, to the organizers of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, uh, to the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, the Study Center and the Bacoor Study Center, the 12 members of the Philippine Historical Society Association, and, uh, and I'm very honored to be with with you all and I'm very honored to be with also a former mentor at university, Dr. Kamagay. <laughs> uh, although I was never her student, uh, I would always consider as a, as a mentor, no matter what. <laughs> well, I'm here to talk about the, uh, the Gagan trade. And if you will allow me, I would like to congest 200, more than 200 years of uh, our relationship with Spain through the Gagans and with our so called the uh, South American or, or uh, Latin American brothers and sisters, okay, also uh, from Mexico all the way down to the point of uh, Tierra del Fuego, okay, and all in 20 minutes. So let me, let's see if I can. Uh, okay, I. Would can you see can you see my slide, Dr. Calairo? We can see your slide. Oh, yes, ma. Let me let me try to uh, uh, share screen there. Uh, I always forget about this share screen. Uh, here we go. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay. 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 Now, uh, okay. Well, I'm, uh, I'm here basically to talk about the Manila Gallon trade and the Trans Pacific exchanges that occurred more than 200 years between the Philippines, Spain, of course, via via the American colonies, okay, especially with Mexico. And I'm here also to talk about the Trans-Pacific exchanges and the importance of these exchanges, not just to our but also even up to the present period with regards to uh, our connections with, with, uh, with Latin America. Okay. And although he would refer to this as an emerging field of study right now. Well, I would prefer to say that it has been an eclectic field, especially from the point uh, from the point of the Philippines, because of uh, we have not actually been uh, uh, establishing stronger relations in terms of educational cultural ties with with uh, Latin America. It's only now, basically, through the uh, through the activities as well of the of PACLAS, no, the Academic Consortium for Latin American Studies, that we are trying to uh, promote no, the importance of Latin American studies. Okay. Now, well, uh, Nick Joaquin, okay, in one of his essays in Cultural History, referred to the Galleon or the Mayla Galleon as the first medium to reduce the world into a village. And this is something that I always mention in my talks with students here and in seminars and conferences abroad that the Galleon trade basically reduced the world in terms of our connection with all the other continents as if it become, the world became smaller and it turned out to be more like a village because now we were connected uh, to those continents. But before that, okay, uh, let's look at how Manila would be, okay? Why Manila would become the entry between 
between Asia and the rest of the world, okay? And it's because of all the goods that you see here on the map, okay, coming from various points from uh, South Asia to Southeast Asia, from North Asia. Okay. Basically, you will have here all of these goods okay, congregating in the city of Manila because of the need for these goods to reach the market in the Americas and later on to the markets in Spain. Okay? Not just in Spain, but in the entire Iberian Peninsula. And as you will see here, what the list of materials that will be coming from these different areas would actually be inside the galleons that will be sailing from Manila to Acapulco. Okay? And then from Acapulco to transfer to the other side, to the Caribbean and to the Atlantic, all the way up to the final destination, and that would be, the, and that would be Spain. Uh, also, if you look at the pre-Hispanic uh, trade relations that we had with other Asian countries, Philippines would be a natural, uh, gath natural gathering point. Well, for for all these goods simply because of our proximity to the major markets in North Asia like China and also from Southeast Asia. So one Spanish historian said that the discovery of the Philippines basically was a God sent um, uh, discovery to the Spanish because basically they were looking for the route towards the spices in, in Southeast Asia. But not only did they discover later on the spices, but of course they discovered also uh, the archipelago of the Philippines, which became a very important uh, route, route, route for them with regards to transporting goods from Asia to the rest of the world. Now, what was the guy? What was the uh, so? In our history books, we always refer to it as the Manila Acapulco Galleon Trade, or simply the Galleon Trade. But in many materials as well, it is also referred to, it was also referred to as the Nao de China because of practically all the major goods that will be collected for the journey from Manila to Acapulco would be coming from North Asia. Okay. And that is from China. And in the previous slides that you saw, uh, you see there that, well, if you are to connect the Philippines with China, it could also be referred to as the Manila Acapulco trade because of the major ports from China from whence all these goods came from. And ever since the return route to Mexico would be discovered by Friar Andres de Urdaneta, one important fact also of the galleons was that for the first 50 years of the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, it was the only regular fleet service that connected the Philippines with the rest of the Spanish empire, okay, crossing through the Pacific. We're in the Asian, uh, the Asian content, continent, together with the Asian continent, with the American continent, were linked together. So we have both worlds being linked together like a great exchange later on from because of this connection would later on erupt. Okay, we're in goods from different parts of the Americas would be traveling not only to Spain, to the Caribbean, to Africa, but more so traveling also to the Philippines and to the rest of Asia. Now, it was all the first global transaction that opened the East to the West. No other global transaction ever occurred in world history as recorded. Unlike what the Galleon trade did okay, during this particular period. At the same time, it was also the longest shipping, it has the history of being the longest shipping line in history, more than 200 years, okay? Because of the, route, the same route that it followed during this entire, entire period. Now, Americans, and when I when I remember talking with, uh, when I was in Sweden, Spain, talking with South Americans, Latin Americans in general, okay, they would always refer to 
things coming from the from this part of the world as either spices or silk. And as I will for example, how the silk is grown would also be a major part of Latin American culture and that also of Hispanic culture. Now, the gallant trade owes its discovery to one particular person, and that was Andres de Urdaneta. Okay, and here is a statue of him uh, uh, during the uh, uh, 500th anniversary also of the uh, birth of Andres de Urdaneta at, at his hometown in Urdipia. Okay, so he's honored in that vast small town in the Basque province, neighboring the same town as that of uh, Legaspi. And uh, people think that the two natives here were Filipinos okay, or are Filipinos. But no, these two natives are not Filipinos, but they do represent the islanders in the Pacific from where the galleons okay, also pass through in their return route to Mexico. Well, we all know the story that one of the major uh, missions of, of Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, okay, together with Andres de Udaneta and his voice from Mexico to the Philippines, was that he should be able to find a return route to Mexico by crossing the Pacific. And no other person has basically made that, that, that discovery except Andres de Urdaneta. And because of that particular discovery, okay, transforming later on Manila into a major entry point, it made Manila as the first primate city in Southeast Asia by the 17th century. The only city okay, in the empire of Spain, in Asia, okay, granted a royal status, as we see here in the um, in the, this particular slide, okay, showing the coat of arms of the city, of the loyal and ever royal city of Manila, uh, the head, Abesa, de las Islas Filipinas, the head of the Philippines and the, uh, the most principal of all of them. Okay. So we were given this particular title as a result of the major uh, success of, of the Galleon trade. Also, aside from that, well, if you look at this map of Manila, an 1818 map of, of Manila showing its way, well, what gave success also to the Galleon was the geographical uh, place of the city of Manila, together with Cavite, okay, from where the galleons would be uh, would be docked and coming from. Okay, well, this is one particular fallacy that many people think that Mani that the galleons came from the city of Manila. No, they 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 were docked and they were loaded with goods in Cavite. Okay. And before they left for the high seas to return to Mexico, they would have to uh, sail towards uh, near the shore of Intramuros, from where people from Intramuros, the church bells would be rung, and the Archbishop of Manila would give its blessings for a safe journey before it leaves the, the bay itself, uh, traveling for a week before it, it actually enters the Pacific Ocean, okay? passing through the, Bisa, uh, the Visayas first, and then before it exits through the Pacific. Okay? So Manila basically was strategically located uh, in a bay that was uh, well guarded by natural defenses at the same time. Uh, uh, of uh, The deep water there provided uh, the exact spot for where the galleons would be docked. Okay. Now, because of the galleon trade, Manila, from the point of view of Europeans visiting the country from their ships, saw a city that was like any European city. And you will see here from a map in the 17th century showing how a Frenchman, okay, they saw the city of Manila from his ship and Practically, he drew it with all the buildings and towers and spires that would that would show Manila at its best during this particular period. Okay. So, Manila, as we would say it, developed into loops and bounds, transforming it into okay, 
uh, a major European enterprise in Southeast Asia. Going back to what I was saying earlier regarding uh, the so-called uh, return trip of of uh, of Udaneta when he was tasked by by uh, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. Okay, I would like to show this briefly, showing that well, the Pacific was not an area to be. Uh, although the word Pacific means calm, it was not that totally calm, even though the name was given by Nunez de Balboa as a, a very calm ocean, and later on Magellan named it the Pacific. As you will see, it was not as it was described. And no other ship had successfully traversed the Pacific Ocean from the Philippines in the previous, um, from the previous, uh, um, um, journeys except Andres de Odaneta. And what did he do? And I would explain this to people and to students by saying that he practically followed okay, the winds, the northern winds, being a cosmographer and a student of the Pacific Ocean already in his previous travels, he of how Japanese fishermen, okay, in their knowledge of the northern part of the Pacific Ocean, would be able to cross from Japan all the way to the fishing grounds in where uh, Alaska would be located. Okay. So basically, he he studied the winds and he followed the the, uh, the route of the winds by being blown from this part of the world towards the Americas. Although he would not be sent directly to Acapulco, still this was the only way to return to the Americas. And from there, he would, they would traverse from California following the coastline until they would reach Mexico. Well, the return trip from Acapulco would always be easier than the return trip to Acapulco. And the return trip was always considered the most dangerous part of the entire story of the galleons. So as you will see here, there, uh, uh, the northern part, okay, with the conversion zones, zones that later on again, um, uh, Udaneta discovered, was where he crossed by not necessarily going too much up to the north where he would be blown by the winds. So he basically discovered uh, a route that was simply below the strong winds heading all the way to California. Now, we always look at how the Galion Cave would transform the world. Okay? So if you look at this particular slide uh, I have here, so if you ask how the Philippines was connected to Spain and to Europe, okay, we would always look at Acapulco, Mexico. The other side of Mexico, facing the Caribbean, would be Veracruz, and from there, from there it would cross to Seville. And Again, if you look at how Asia later on would be connected to Manila, okay, you will see that the various trading ports that I showed earlier, okay, leading to the major ports, and later on returning with their goods from the city of Manila, you will see that from China, India, as far as Persia, okay, all these goods would find its way towards Manila. And even how Africa okay, would be connected. And of, we would be connected to Africa via South, via Latin America, passing to the Caribbean, and then okay, going all the way down to the African coastline. Okay. Of course, from there, it's not only Spain would be involved in the market, but their erstwhile counterpart, and that is Portugal, okay, would also be okay, slightly involved in the gallon trade, although they may be enemies from time to time with regards to with regards to finances and money money above all would would not raise the issue of their differences okay i remember a quote from the biography uh, biography on on Christopher Columbus when uh, he was he asked when he asked the um, uh, uh, as a, a banker, why was he being supported by this banker? And he said that, well, um, okay, uh, 
above above everything else, quoting from the Bible, hope and love, he said, is finances. So above all of these things, finances will be the name of the day during this particular year. Uh, during the entire traverse, uh, the entire history of the galleon trade, uh, there was at least 110 galleons that traveled between Manila and Acapulco. And, but, the, but the interesting part here, as I mentioned in a conference before, was that only eight of them were made in Mexico. The only eight of them. And most of these galleons were made in... Uh, the, all, all of these galleons were made in, in specific parts of the Philippines where there was a forest that would be providing the major trees to make these galleons. Aside from that, of course, would be the labor that would be needed for the building of these galleons. So I listed here the provinces of Cavite, Pangasinan, Albay, Mindoro, Solsogon, uh, Iloilo, Masbate, uh, Marinduque. Okay. I think I missed some, uh, one province here, which I do not want to miss. Uh, I don't know if I... But... Uh, Back to that movie, <laughs> the, the, uh, the Zoom from there. And according to uh, Dr. Shirley Fish, who wrote a book on the Manila Acapulco Garden Trade, citing from that book, okay, that the main hardwoods used by the Spanish shipbuilders for making the making these galleons were either Palo Maria, Banaba, and Dangan. Uh, people would ask, we have good trees like the Nara and the Kamagong, and but the natural answer to that was that they were too heavy and they were too strong to bend. So these three particular uh, tree, trees were used for building the galleons. And they are like, uh, one student said, sir, the is what you drink now, yes, but have you seen the tree? Which is what you, what you are seeing is just a small part of, of the tree, okay? And the tree is really really big. And this tree that I have in front of you is the Dangan, okay, which is mostly located in the, in the areas of Mindoro uh, and Ibagon. Okay. So when I saw it one time, I was well, this big and people say that they still use it for making their boats okay, up to now. Now, because of uh, how the galleons would also later on uh, affect you know, the local history of the towns. Well, I specifically uh, use the example of the home, my hometown, and that is now one in Mindoro. Okay, and I remember Dr. Isagani used to uh, talk a lot about local history, toponyms, and uh, he said that well, now one from now. Okay, well there is another story based from the people from Nauhan who maybe say that because of Nauhau, but another, okay, another toponym from this, for this would be Nauhan, where the galleons were made. And the famous Puerto Galera, famous beach of Puerto Galera, was where the Naos were completed and were removed before they were baptized by being into the open seas. And that is one area where the galleons were also Made okay, so in all in practically all of these provinces that I mentioned, there would be a little historical account of basically connecting towns and provinces. And one example would be Nido, okay, from the small town known as Nauhan. And the ships, uh, as uh, as mentioned by Dr. Legado in his book, After the Galleons, quoting from, uh, from a diary of a British uh, admiral, he said, describe the ships as being strong, that their breastwork were of Philippine hardwood that could not be pierced by cannonballs. They, and this was the reputation of our ships. That's why when these ships uh, were being either captured by pirates or by by the English or by the Dutch. It was not simply what was inside the galleons that were also treasured, but the entire ship itself because of uh, how the ship was built and 
knowing that these ships were made from Philippine hardwood. Now, these ships, of course, uh, in the towns that I mentioned, would not have been made if not for labor, forced labor. And this is where the other side of the galleon story would have to be would have to be studied, and that is definitely forced labor was used in making these galleons, okay? like the polo and servicios. And for more than 200 years, Filipinos, okay, the natives, were uh, were displaced from one town to the other, never to return to their respective homes because okay, once they were there, many of them would literally die while making the uh, while making the galleons, and not all of them would be able to return to their hometowns. This particular problem would have a major result in terms of rebellions later on and in terms also of the demographic structure of the Philippines that would go down through the years because of the displacement of people. Okay. So it was not only diseases that would kill the natives, but also as an effect of the polo and servicios through the displacement in making the galleons. Now, these galleons, as you all know, were big, and each uh, each investor would have to buy a bolera or a coupon to be able to put a particular product inside inside the galleon. Okay. And these galleons were not built basically to defend itself. Also, in the high seas, they were built simply to transport and. The galleons had to be built in such a way that not only they could not only could they carry heavy loads, but they could they could sail faster and evade the pirates and any enemy ship that would try to harass them in the open seas. Now, we've all we all know the story of how well much earlier, where after Columbus discovered the Americas that a great Columbian exchange would occur. So not only men, not only or people traveled from one place to the other, but as, I've, uh, as I will show you here, so not only food travel, not only livestock, but also diseases travel. And so I remember basically when 1992, when the 500th year of the discovery of the Americas was being celebrated uh, with the coming of, with the production of the movie, The Quest for Paradise, to celebrate that in 1992. Uh, it did not put aside how the so-called mortality rate, the death of the Indians occurred, not because they were massacred, not because they went hungry, but simply also because of the diseases that traveled from Europe Okay, all the way to the new colonies in the Americas. Okay. And we can refer to this as the Great Columbian Exchange. But this Columbian Exchange will later on extend to the Philippines because these goods that you see coming, entering Europe, will also be goods, will also include goods coming from Asia okay, that will be included with all of these goods coming from the Americas, entering Asia, and then from Asia and Africa you will also have goods like olives, coffee beans, other fruits, ba bananas, okay? All these things that we think are indigenous to our tables, but actually uh, they, are, they are not indigenous. And I remember in quoting Dr. Medina's work on the fruit migrants to the Philippines, so many of these fruits and vegetables simply migrated together with, well, with the boats. So an interesting uh, uh, point here is what were inside the galleons. So from China, you have silk. From Japan, silverware, silk as well. Silk as well. From the Moluccas, the spices. From other parts of Asia, porcelain especially coming from Thailand and Indochina. From India and Persia, carpet, spices, and other goods. From the Philippines, wood, and as I mentioned earlier, hardwood, okay, uh, uh, traveled as well because some of this wood 
and uh, you will see this in um, in many churches also in Spain, where they would be very proud to say that the wood used inside the for the retablos came from the Philippines. Even the room of Philip II himself at the El Escorial, one guide said, all of this, uh, all of these things that you see here, even his bed, all came from the Philippines. So even uh, Philip II slept on hardwood made coming from the Philippines. Okay. So from textiles, bird's nest or needle soup, okay, pearls, mangoes, tamarind, and of course to name other things as well. Later on you have tuba, for example, as popularized in Mexico. And aside from that, you have in Cuba, I remember a Cuban showing me a mango and he proudly said, we call this mango Filipino. Ah, see, so we don't know why, but maybe it traveled from your part of the way. And I said, definitely, yes, if you call it mango Filipino, it did travel from the Philippines. Okay, because it's the same yellowish mango that we have here. Now, from this end, we have these goods coming from China, from the Philippines, from other parts of the world, traveling across the Pacific. And then from the other end, aside from the silver, in payment for the colonial administration, in payment for the goods, goods coming from Africa, especially coffee, ivory, okay, uh, uh, from Europe, well, uh, not so much, and one uh, Spaniard even said, yes, I think uh, uh, immigrants from the, from the immigrants from Spain together with missionaries and other products also traveled from Spain. But the majority of this actually would be coming from the Americas, okay? crossing over to the Pacific to the Philippines. And all of them will be congregating in Acapulco, Mexico with the cacao or the chocolate drink, all these other plant products that we have, okay, sayotes. That's why later on you will you will see the um, the existence of Indian words in the in some Philippine languages or Nahuatl words, especially in the province of Pampanga. And root crops like maize, you know, maize, okay, potatoes, okay, all of this would be coming from the outside, even ilang ilang, our famous ilang ilang, they would be coming from the outside. Now, um, in the Americas, as you will see here, the life of the Indians would be transformed by these goods coming from the from the America, coming from Europe, especially the introduction of of beasts of the burden like the ox, okay. The introduction of uh, uh, of, of 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 equipment for for harvesting for sowing, so all of this will be introduced into the new world. Thus, therefore, changing also the lifestyle of of the natives. Now, one particular uh, product that even up to now Spaniards would always refer to us coming from the Philippines. Though I would always like to correct them that, uh, well, we never had silk grown in the Philippines because silk came from China, would be this manton called manton de Manila, okay? And a manton de Manila, okay, um, would be a size that would be as big as what you see being worn by this woman on the left, or as small as what the former queen of Spain The, the manton, okay, because everyone knows the manton de Manila, okay. Uh, but although we do not uh, want to make it here, okay, uh, it's now made in Spain, they still call it the yeah, manton de Manila. And a popular song is still being sung up to now, especially by the older women who would always sing this song. And I remember my landlady saying, it is if I've heard of it, I said, no, I've never heard of this. And it's a song. It talks about where are you going with the manton de Manila? Okay, where are you going? Dressed like a Chinese. Donde vas con vestido chinés? So they see that 
okay, from this song, they knew that the silk came from Manila, but what they think as it being transported from Manila gave its name, the Manton de Manila. Okay, they, now, they don't call it uh, the Manton de, de China. They simply call it Manton de Manila. Okay. Now, in, in terms of languages, the Gallon trade transported the Spanish language. Okay, the transport. There have been many studies done on uh, the presence of Hispanismos okay, in the Philippine language, no? whether in the Tagalog or in the other major languages in the Philippines. But to name a few that we have here, okay, and to show you also how it would be how it would be used right now. For example, we are very used to saying asal, nahaka asal. Okay, so it means that we are irritated, which is common in Tagalog, Ilocano, Kapampangan, and Chabacano. Uh, for us, it means to, to be annoyed or to irritate. But in Spanish, it simply means to roast. That's why we have the word asado. Or even the word... Uh, uh, a favorite word here that I use, well, as an example, would be batada. Okay, a batada for us would be a group of friends. But a batada basically means a boatload of people. Okay, a batada. And so it goes the same with the rest also of the other words that you see here, asta. Okay, for us, it's a rude movement, you know, that we always see. Na masama ang asta, a bad movement, okay, a bad gesture. But it would mean in Spanish, hasta, meaning until, okay? And one um, uh, linguist said that it could be, according to him, as an expression that you are only allowed to be like this up to a certain point. Beyond that, it will no longer be acceptable. So that is where the word hasta would be coming from, okay? So in the Philippine languages, especially in Chabacano and Cavite, we see here even the differences in Chabacano, okay, in, Zam, in Cavite and Zamboanga. So as an example, like, of course, the word Chabacano in Spanish is not a good word. It simply means uh, rustic or vulgar, okay? okay, the word Chabacano. Because in Spanish, when you refer to Chabacano, it means that you are not well-mannered, okay? So the same thing has been used in the Philippine languages, but now it's a, a language. So you even see the differences between Chabacano de Zamboanga, Chabacano de Cavite, and now it will be said in Spanish, okay? With the same meaning because, of course, uh, grammar is not actually recognized in Chabacano, okay? As compared to how it is said in, in Spanish. So, as I said, in the terms of the Philippine languages, okay, in terms of our culture being inheriting Hispanic culture, we all owe it to all these people, basically, that came from the galleons that traversed. Okay, so, all, all of this came and crossed the ocean to come to us because, well, um, Spanish would be brought over by the Spanish speakers. Okay, and you will see that uh, how how much our language has been influenced even by Mexican Spanish, okay? Uh, uh, the Real Academia de la Lengua Española in Spain recognizes the Spanish spoken in the Philippines as part of such language. Words that are simply not, how would I say, indigenous to Spain itself because they do recognize the Spanish that developed in Latin America and the Spanish that developed in the in the Philippines as part of the Spanish language. Well, a very important uh, part of the Gallon trade, of course, the Gallon trade was established simply to make sure that uh, the colony survives, that we become self-sufficient in terms of uh, sustaining okay, the Spaniards in the Philippines. And so you have money as being the number one game in the galleon trade. And uh, these are 
this is a sample of the silver or later on what will be referred to as pieces of ink. Pure uh, coins that were the that were used as the as the international currency for the Galleon trade. So long before the dollar arrived, it was the it was uh, silver that came from Mexico, minted in Spain, okay, minted in the colonies. That would be the international currency preferred by all businessmen. Even the Chinese would prefer uh, payment through these coins for their business. Okay, and. Uh, of course, on the left side, you will see there, this is the moneda de dos mundos, the two worlds. Meaning the two worlds would be the Americas and that of Europe. Later on, these two worlds would be, represent, would be representing the entire Spanish empire through, uh, 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 as will be seen in the use of this currency. And it's quite interesting that the ships that would later on be hunted down in the in the high seas, just like this one, okay, uh, be waylaid in the in the Pacific. Some of them actually were even attacked within the field area because pirates were were in abundance not only from the south, from Mindanao, but also Dutch privateers and British privateers that would try to disrupt also the garden trade, especially the returning ships because the returning ships carried silver. And that was where well, these were the ships that they wait out in the open seas and into the uh, in the and also in the Visayan region upon entering the Philippines. Now going back to the coins, okay. So when you think of the the dollar now, these coins, these Spanish coins made from pure silver, okay, and uh, would be the main currency of the day uh, of that day. And this explains how these coins would be legal tender even until 1857, where they would even before, way before the peso would later were be introduced, these were the coins that were used even in the Philippines and in the entire Latin American continent. Now, I would like to take attention to the symbols because these two symbols show the Spanish crown and then you have the two towers on the left and the right showing the main uh, uh, motto of the Spanish flag, plus ultra, we need to go further, okay? uh, which is the motto of the empire, to go further, to go into the deep. But later on, these two, tow these two particular tow towers or torres that you see here, as you will see here also in this point from 1739. Okay? Now, if you look at the origin of the US dollar, and this is what would interest students because the symbol of the dollar sign would be coming actually from, from these coins, from the representing these coins. So you have the S symbol plus ultra later on being used and applied by later on by the dollar sign, by the dollar as its universal symbol. So you see its origins basically were from uh, from the Sp present Spanish flag and also from what was represented in these coins. So you see a continuance, basically, although unofficially, of the effects of the garden trade, even in the world. Okay, okay, okay. so this one, plus ultra, and you see the symbol of the dollar sign there. Later on, even in the American uh, uh, currency, okay, like this from Tennessee, you will see that, well, uh, initially before the dollar would come in, they were using even um, Spanish coinage as payment also for labor, for other goods being served or being transported in the United States. So even the dollar symbol has its origins in the Guardian trade. Now we, uh, one particular, um, important part of our history that would show people how important the gallon tray would be and what it contained would be the discovery of the San Diego, you know, way back in the 90s, I remember this very well, where the San Diego 
uh, newly arrived at Cavite with its wood still inside, the silver inside. And because the Dutch appeared and were threatening the Philippines, Wasabi transformed, transformed from a galley to that of a battleship. And when it met the Dutch fleet off the coast of Batangas, off the coast of Nasugbu, in, in less than two hours, the ship was already sinking because it was too slow, too heavy, with all the goods still inside from porcelain to silver. Okay, because at a certain point, silver will also be transported from this part of the world as payment for other goods from the other side. Okay. So now you have here the uh, how the, the, the Spanish silver, the, the pieces of eight would later on be in these two continents. Now this is a, uh, a picture from a Dutch manuscript showing how the, how the Dutch ship under uh, Admiral Oliver Van Noof destroyed uh, San Diego. And the San Diego sank, as seen now at the Museo Naval de, de Madrid, this is the, uh, a replica of the San Diego as seen in, um, in Madrid, okay, at the Museo Naval. Uh, now, when uh, underwater archaeologists discovered the, uh, the San Diego, they discovered porcelain ware still intact. The lining of the cover, covered with corals that even the goods inside from seas to spices were still intact. That after 400 years, almost 400 years, when it was open, that was the only time when they became wet. Okay. And so uh, this was how they looked like when they were discovered that even the remains or the skeleton remains of the ship were still intact. Okay. So they were able to study the wood, which does confirm that it was made from Philippine hardwood. Okay, so this was how the um, how the Philippine hardwood was established as a main uh, as a main uh, what material for making this for making the galleons. And some of these goods now are displayed in the National Museum and in in Madrid. Which unfortunately, in Madrid, if you are to go there, the Museum of Bar. That is where the silver from the the silver coins discovered from the galleons are unfortunately located. Okay, as the, uh, the Philippine government allowed them to keep all of this and bring it back to Spain, and we were left basically with uh, with these goods to to display in our museum. So an astrolab, for example, is what we have here in Manila, and also uh, all other porcelain wares and jars like this one that are mostly displayed here in Manila at the National Museum. And all these are documented in the book, The Treasures of, of the San Diego, which therefore became what you might call the basis also in giving importance to what the galleons actually carried from one point to the other. Now, the damaging effects of the galleon, okay? As I've said earlier, uh, with people being moved from one place to the other, okay, it affected agriculture, it affected the population, it affected the population in terms of Filipino labor. Agriculture, because in, especially in the north, in, um, in the Ilocos region, uh, many of the, like a good example is like uh, when they were, um, when, what you call that, the, the agricultural products were left were left untended because of the absence of the male population. And this not only happened in the Ilocos, but also in Pampanga, which led to the Pampanga Revolt in 1660, because of the absence of the, the male that would, uh, uh, that would harvest the goods. Okay? It affected the agricultural calendar of the natives. Okay? Population growth because uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, there was a high mortality rate okay, of, of deaths. Okay? And of course, uh, we even reached a certain point where we almost reached a zero population uh, because 
fact of the absence of the men, the men, okay? And because they were what? They were being used as laborers in making the galleons, being transferred from one province to another. And because of this, uh, as I've said earlier, many of them were forced to plant, instead of rice, they were forced to plant coconut trees because the coconut trees at that point were very important, not because also of uh, uh, what you call that, of making tuba, but more so because at that time, in, uh, as so whale oil was very, uh, was very useful in oiling the wood, in making the galleons, they found a substitute and that was the use of coconut oil. So coconut oil or what the faith our famous virgin coconut oil now, already was discovered by the Spanish as early as the time as a substitute for whale oil. And they were forced to uh, plant coconut, they were forced to plant uh, uh, things that were not part of their diet. So that resulted to the deaths of these people. And uh, in the Ilocos, okay, they were forced to what? To plant out cotton because the women had to make uh, had to make the clothes, the sails for the galleons. They were they were part also of the working force because even the sails of the ships were made in the Philippines, and they were made usually from Iloco woven cotton. Okay. And of course, this also led to revolts, and uh, two good examples revolts that that were direct result of the galleon trade was the Sumoy Revolt in 1649 and the Pampanga Revolt in 1660. Well, because they were all affected by the uh, unjust injustice and the uh, uh, slave-like life, they were living as forced laborers in making the galleons. So the Sumoy Revolt, as you will see here, was a direct result of the galleon trade, okay, and also the Pampanga Revolt, which was a major uh, case for the Spaniards in the Philippines because Pampanga was a major area where they got most of their food supply, especially rice, as uh, being the center for, for the so-called rice fields that supplied Central Luzon and the city of Manila. Now, as I said earlier, the galleons brought everything from food to animals to fruits to language and culture. And studies had been made already in the regarding the presence of Nahuatl words or Aztec words in the Philippine languages. For example, you have tiangue, cacao, okay, tamales, okay, sayote, sing tamas, okay, just to name a few. Okay, most of them would be. Well, the Kapampangan language would be a very rich example of the presence of Nabokto words in the Kapampangan language. Well, on the other hand, on the other end, especially in Mexico, as I as we have witnessed, you have Mexicans still making tuba from the way uh, uh, what you call that from the same way as we make tuba here. Okay, especially in the city of Mexico, uh, their Chinatown there in called Parian, because we also had a Parian here, Manila and in Cebu, but the oldest is in the Philippines, okay? And of course, you have Ilang Ilang, okay? Which uh, they also use there as what? As a, uh, what you call that? As a means, as a perfume, okay? The same way as it was used also by our pre-Hispanic ancestors. Now, all of this, okay, would be whether positive or negative, it would be the results of the Gagan trade. And uh, one would be the great intercultural exchange that would later on exist between the Philippines and the Americas. And that is what basically is what we have to strengthen nowadays. Okay? Because maybe our ties with Spain, yes, we have established it. We are still, uh, what you call that, we, uh, we maintain our ties with them. But I think we've overlooked also in a way our ties with Latin America and not just with Mexico, but especially with Chile, okay, uh, facing the Pacific, okay, and uh, 
um, and how Philippine goods as far as Lima, Peru, okay, they would reach even Lima, okay, on the other, uh, the other northern part of the uh, uh, of the South American part of the Americas. Okay, they will all okay, be reached also by all these goods. So, as I've said earlier, okay, our culture in terms of food, and lately for the past two weeks, I've been listening to people talk about the, the flavors or los sabores que cruzado en el Pacifico, the flavors that cross the Pacific from Spain to, to, to Mexico and to the Philippines and back discussions on the origins of adobo, okay? Uh, and the, uh, especially in one particular, uh, one particular uh, into, uh, product that we actually introduce not just in Spain, but also in Italy, would be the, the black ink from the squid. Okay, uh, because there is such a thing as paella negra. And the paella negra or the black rice, Spanish, would not have existed if not for the squid ink that we introduced to Spain through the galleon trade. Okay, because we are, we use, we use it here, so now they learn to use it. And even in Italy, they recognize the fact that when they, they refer to the pasta nero, the black spaghetti, they also know that it, its origins came from this part of the world. Now, um, well, there's uh, one or two more slides and I'll end, I'm sorry. And you will see here, well, uh, one enduring uh, result, and I've interviewed some people already who witnessed the last bullfighting in Manila, okay, in 1952. They were children at that time, okay. Uh, this is something that we lost, maybe for the good, because I think we would not enjoy watching a bullfight because of what happens in a bull ring, okay. But uh, we once enjoyed this as as a sport, as more as popular as that of basketball at that time. But after 1952, it it, uh, it no longer was practiced here. For why? Because the bulls were expensive. Uh, second, as one uh, witness said, well, they had to import uh, Mexican bullfighters and Spanish bullfighters, but most of them were Mexicans to come to the Philippines and to and to play here, which made the sport very expensive. Okay. So the last one was in 1952. Okay, and this was the the last bullfight that was held outside the wall of Intramuros. So as a reflection, as an end to my presentation now, um, well, not only should we reflect on the importance of the Trans-Pacific exchanges that occurred, but also the importance of what Trans-Pacific studies could contribute also to the study of Philippine history. Okay. Uh, I think it's an important part in our history where as we celebrate the 500 years of the arrival of, of the Spanish in the country, then we also have to look also into our relations with our nearest neighbors in the Spanish Empire. And that would be the countries in Latin America, okay, from Mexico all the way down. And the importance of increasing our relations with them, not just economic and education, but also cultural. Okay, also cultural. Um, um, some universities in Chile are already uh, were, were, are already teaching okay, trans-Pacific studies, including Philippine history, as my in terms of uh, what uh, was communicated to me by some uh, some friends there. You know that. Okay? So I think we should reciprocate as we move towards the five minute year as well. Okay that we should reciprocate in terms of our relation with the rest also of the Spanish or Hispanic world. Thank you very much and uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, maraming maraming salamat din po sa very um, ano, uh, content, uh, rich content uh, presentation. No? Dito sa amin sa Cavite, Nasa Kabiti Study Center ako nung binanggit mo uh -huh. yun. Ano, alam ko maraming nagulat mo no? na, na ang uh, galleon ay hindi binababa sa, ay yung mga gamit, no? hindi binababa 
dala, no? Hindi binabasa man nila, ngunit sa Cavite. At kung Cavite, ay tinatransport siya by land, going to Manila, no? So, ang laking ano noon, no? Malaking, uh, kaya siguro si, ano, si, uh, uh, of course, the late Nick Joaquin, meron siyang libro, yung Camino Real, di ba? Uh, dyan daw, idinadaan yun, eh. Nasa Camino Real, yung mga galyo na nagdadak sa, ano, Cavite City, bidababa sa Cavite City mga gamit uh-huh. then uh-huh. that transport going to uh, uh, Manila no Manila well, uh, uh-huh. sa ngayon ano ba ang uh, yeah uh, of course Cavite City is also known for its uh, chabacano nabanggit mo na rin yes oo oh. pero yun nga magkakaroon ng ano no ng uh, malaking interest ang mga heritage advocate diyan kasi sa ngayon alam natin na ang Cavite ay that transport uh, gagawin nilang international airport At uh, alam naman natin sa maraming bansa na ang airport, ang kanilang always for tourism promotion, yung kanilang uh, history and culture, no? sa mga painting mm-hmm. nila, di ba? So ang, ang ganda sana ng ano, no? uh, gawing motif no? ng, uh, uh, ng new uh, ano, no? mga buildings o mga structures, no? yung uh, heritage ng Cavite City, which is legal yun. No? Oo, no, tama um, yun. Even nga yung Chabacano, sir, uh, yung Chabacano, Ang Latin City ay uh, San Buanga, di ba? <laughs> ano, the Latin City? Uh, di ba? Pero ang gamit ng Cavite City ay uh, sobrang uh, historical, di ba? Pero bakit gano'n? Uh, I think ito may sinasabi natin na yung present, no? present generation, meron siyang kinalaman dun sa promoting the past. No? So, mm-hmm. kung halimbawa, medyo mabagal yung present generation, ah, baka maunahan ka, di ba? Dun sa, sa ganong klase ng mga context, no? Anyway, mga kababayan, tayo po ay uh, nanonood pa rin, no? nakikinig ng, uh, ng webinar on uh, um, Philippine-Spanish Heritage. At uh, since wala pa naman tayong masyadong mga question, uh, dediretso po tayo sa next speaker. Siguro last na lang, no? na putuwa ako dun sa, ano, eh, sa lecture. Eh. Um, pag napupunta tayo sa mga pet shop, di ba mayroong mga... May mga Uh, aquarium. Tapos sa loob ng aquarium, karaniwan meron doon uh, treasure chest. No? Mga ganun-ganun, di ba? <laughs> Tapos malabas yung bula. It's, it's very historical. Kasi yan po yung ano eh. No? Yan po yung mga nag-capsize ng mga, <laughs> ng mga galleons. No? Nadala yung mga silvers, di ba? At uh, uh-huh. ayun, um, ginagawan, hindi nila alam na napaka-historical pala nung bagay na yun. No? Even yung <laughs> pirates of the Caribbean, no? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so pati yung Peter Pan, di ba, yung kalaban niya, pirate. Pero ano yan, lahat yan ay part of our uh, history. So siguro hintay natin ibang mga tanong no? uh, later on. No? At ako okay. muna salamat. tayo sa ating susunod natin si Pidya. Of course, syempre, si ma'am, no? uh, dati kong teacher. So I'm very proud no? na maging uh, uh, professor ko ang susunod natin tiga pagsalita. Siya po ay ang kinikilalang, uh, well, Bihirang-bihira yung maging Professor Emeritus ng UP Department of History. No? Talagang uh, nandun yung, ano, no? yung, uh, yung uh, qualification. No? Of course, dating uh, chair ng uh, UP Department of History at uh, matagal din naging uh, uh, editor-in-chief ng uh, UP Press. No? No? At uh, marami pa siyang sinasali ang mga samahan at mga uh, institusyon. But uh, sa ngayon, Uh, is leading the Philippine Historical Association as a president. No? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I would like to give you my uh, former professor in history, uh, Dr. Uh, Maria Luisa Camagay, no, to discuss something about the uh, uh, matrona titular, no, na hindi natin karaniwang alam sa grassroot level. Yan. So, ma'am, you have the floor, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Francis. for recognizing me as your former <laughs> teachers <laughs> or colleagues. Francis was, uh, Chas was my colleague in the department. Uh, Manny was my uh, advisee. Uh, <laughs> very good um, evidences of uh, what they have become after, uh, you know, studying in UP and being part of the Department of History. Okay. Uh, the recent news about an increase in the number of babies conceived during the period of the lockdown makes my topic this morning most appropriate. According to the Population Commission, the 1.7 million births 
projected for this year has been increased by 214,000 because of the lockdown caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Why do I say appropriate? This is because my topic is about the Matronas Titulares. Who are the Matronas Titulares? These are the licensed midwives who were asked to assist in the delivery of babies during the Spanish period. This short sharing will include the reasons given for the opening of a school of midwifery, how the matronas titulares discharged their duties, how they were received by the local women, and how they confronted the traditional midwives. I will end by citing the similar situation of our Hilot and the Dukon Bayi, or the traditional healers of Netherlands Indies, as well as the plight of the matron titulares and the certified midwives of Indonesia during the Spanish and Dutch colonial period, respectively. Medicalization of maternal and child care came in the 19th century and was evident with the establishment of a school of midwifery. In the Philippines, this initiative was seen in the establishment in 1879 of a school of midwifery attached to the School of Medicine and Pharmacy of the University of Santo Tomas. According to the rector of UST, then Father Gregorio Echeverria, the school was established out of a serious desire to save the lives of mothers and the newborn. To stress the urgency of the project, Father Echeverria cited the inhuman practices of the parteras or the traditional midwives. Among them were the following. One, the pregnant woman is hung by the hair during prolonged labor. Two, the pregnant woman was made to go up and down the house through the window. Three, the partera exerts pressure against the belly of the pregnant woman to expel the baby. For the partera forcibly pulls the protruding part of the body of the baby, example, an arm or any extremity which appears. Five, the partera pulls the umbilical cord violently to the point of breaking the cord. Uh, six, firecrackers are exploded to frighten the mother in labor with the aim of expelling the baby. From the eyes of Father Echeverria, these acts were simply inhuman and horrifying. By 1886, 40 women have obtained their certificates, qualifying them as licensed midwives. In light of this, Father Echeverria recommended the creation of 22 positions of matronas titulares to be distributed throughout the colony. When the creation of 22 positions was approved on May 1887, a call was made for applicants to the position. The applicant had to present the following documents. One, a letter of application for the position desired addressed to the governor general. Two, a copy of the professional certificate. Three, documents men showing merits received in the practice of the profession, for a certificate of good moral character given by the parish priest of the Pueblo where she was born or resides in and countersigned by the gobernador Silo, and five, a cedula personal. From a total of 27 applicants, 22 were finally chosen. These 22 positions were distributed in the following manner. 12 positions in the first class provinces and five each in the second and third class provinces. The first class provinces included Intramuros, the Arabales of Binondo, Santa Cruz, Tundo, Quiapo, San Miguel, and San Palo as one unit, Ermita, Malate, Paco, another unit grouping, the provinces of Albay, Bulacan, Batangas, Pampanga, and Pangasinan. The second class provinces included the provinces of Camarines Sur, Cavite, Ilocos Sur, Ilocos Norte, and Zambales, 
while the third class provinces comprise the provinces of Bataan, Cagayan, Isabela de Luzon, Mevesija, and Nueva Vizcaya. In making the assignments, the names of the applicants were to be arranged according to one, grade obtained in the exam from highest to lowest, two, the date of obtaining the degree from earliest to latest, and third, the date of application from the earliest to the latest. Most of the candidates for the positions of Matroyana titular came from the Arabales of Manila with a significant number coming from Binondo. The matronas assigned to the positions belonging to the first class provinces got a salary of 14 pesos a month. Those assigned to the second class category received 12 pesos a month. And finally, those assigned to the third class category, 10 pesos a month. The original proposal suggested 25 pesos monthly for the matronas serving the provinces classified as first class, 20 pesos for those serving in the second class provinces, and 15 pesos for those serving in the third class provinces. However, the auditor's office together with the Direction General de Administración Civil felt that the matron should not, the matrona should not receive more than what the vacunador or the person in charge of inoculating children against smallpox was receiving. It appears that the original proposal for the salary of the matrona was a salary scale given to the vacunador. It was cited that the services of the matronas were neither difficult nor frequent, unlike those of the vacunadores who had to leave their place of residence to exercise their profession when they were ordered to or when the circumstances demanded their doing so. It was likewise argued that the matronas should not receive more than what the teacher was receiving that is 8 to 12 pesos for a mestra de entrada, 12 to 15 pesos for a mestra de ascenso, and 15 to 20 pesos for a mestra de termino. It was argued that the work of the matronas did not have the same importance as the mestra de instrucción primaria. The matronas titulares were given free professional service, were to give free professional services to women recognized as poor or to women whose spouses did not have the resources than their daily pay. These services included prenatal and postnatal care. The matronas were to advise pregnant with mothers of the ways of easing discomfort during pregnancy. They were also exhorted to make sure that the life of the mother and the baby was not to be jeopardized. When the life of the mother or the child was in danger, the matrona was required to call the medico titular or the municipal doctor. In the event that the situation needed immediate attention and not having the time to call a medico titular, the matrona was allowed no, to employ the necessary assistance in accordance with her acquired knowledge and therefore must present herself to the medical titular to brief him on the case. The regulamento governing the duties and responsibilities of the matrona was explicit in extending legal protection to matronas in the pursuit of their profession. Article 17 of the regulamento gave the matronas titulares the right to be protected by authorities in the practice of their profession. The regulamento strongly admonished the matronas to give of the native women with the aim of winning them away from the influence of the wives. This campaign against traditional midwives is evident in Article 13 and 15 of the regulamento. Article 13. 15 reads, the matrona should be friendly to the pregnant women and give them peace of mind, not showing the seriousness of the condition when they are in danger. Likewise, by means of persuasion, they should try to get these women to seek their advice if they have certain beliefs which may be injurious to their health. Article 13, on the other hand, reads, it is also the obligation of the matrona to advise 
advise the pregnant women and the new mothers about the use of hygiene as what science counsels for their state and about the remedies they have to use accordingly. At the same time, they should inculcate in the mind of the women the evils and perils of the absurd practices of the archipelago. I mean, in reference to the um, uh, use of the hilo. How successful was the matrona in convincing the native women to seek her attendance will be reflected by the number of deliveries she assisted. The matronas were required to submit reports of the cases they handled. The reports varied in presentation. For example, Ramona Mojica, the matrona of Tundo in 1888, presented her report with columns indicating the month, the name of the patient, the state of the baby upon birth, dead or alive, the sex of the baby, and the address of the mother. Ramona Mojica submitted 10 names of women she assisted in childbirth, Juliana de los Santos, the matrona of uh, Ermita, Malate, and Paco, reported 14 women she assisted in childbirth. Her report had three columns indicating the name of the mother, the pueblo where the mother came from, and her observations. Benita Miranda, the matrona titular of Intramuros, simply listed the names of women whom she assisted in childbirth. Her list had 18 names in it. The report submitted by Rufina Alex, the matrona titular of Santa Cruz, had 10 columns with the following headings. Name of mother, her age, civil status, Arabal, where she came from, her address, the racial group she belonged, a description of delivery, and the dates when the matrona was in assistance. By 1892, a uniform format was followed by the matronas in their semestral reports. The reports indicated the name, age, civil status, and address of the patient, the nature of assistance, and the date of delivery. From the available statistical reports submitted by the few matronas, uh, it would appear that very few women availed of the free services offered by the matrona titular. For instance, in the already densely populated Arabal of Tondo in 1892, the matrona titular Ramona Mojica reported 16 cases for the first semester and 18 for the second semester with a total of 34 cases for the entire year. For the Arabal of Binondo, another densely populated area, Matrona titular Filomena Rubin assisted 17 deliveries during the first semester and 18 and 16 during the second semester, making a total of 33 cases for the year. It appears that the native women still prefer the services of the traditional midwives. Why was this so? There are many factors to explain the situation. One would be age. The traditional midwife was usually an older woman, while the licensed midwife was young, a young woman. With age, of course, would come experience, making the traditional midwife or helot rich in wisdom and experience, unlike the young and newly trained licensed midwife. Another factor working for the helot was her being considered an insider in the community. La uh, licensed midwives were supposed to be open to being assigned in communities where they did not, where they were not residents of. For example, Doña Rosa Andres, a mestiza española from Candelaria Zambales, was assigned in Albay. Another was found herself assigned in Ilocos Norte. By virtue of these examples, we clearly see that they, the licensed midwives, were considered outsiders by the community that they were serving. The most important advantage of the traditional midwife was the fact that she assumed postpartum care for the mother and the newly delivered baby. Her task did not end with the delivery of the baby. The healer continued to visit the mother and the child, massaging the abdomen of the mother to restore it to its former state and treating the umbilical cord of the baby. Moreover, the helot was ready to assume 
household work for the recuperating mother. Matters like age, experience, being part of the community, and the readiness in assuming postnatal services by the HELOT made her a favored and welcome entity for the native expectant mother. Reading the book, Healers on the Colonial Market, Native Doctors and Midwives, in the Dutch East Indies by Elizabeth Heslick, provided uncanny similarities of the situation of the Dukon Bayi or Dukon Beranak in the Dutch East Indies and the Hilot in Spanish colonial Philippines. The Dutch colonial authorities established a school of midwifery in 1851 antedating by 28 years the School of Midwifery in the Philippines. Like in the case of the Philippines, the Dutch used as justification for the establishment of the School of Midwifery, the quote unquote uh, uh, incompetent, ignorant, and dirty Dukon Bayi who assisted childbirth in the villages. Both the colonial masters in the Philippines and Indonesia, in short, demonize the traditional midwives in their desire to modernize and westernize maternal and child care. Both colonial authorities tried to win the native women from using the services of the traditional midwife, but were very unsuccessful. The profile of the Dukon Bayi was similar to our Hilo. She was old, rich in experience, an insider in the community, and ready to provide postnatal care. She was preferred by the native women of the Dutch East Indies because she allowed the practice of some custom and beliefs uh, uh, found in the Adat, such as rubbing the belly and limbs of the mother with herbs and garlic to ward off evil spirits. Garlic is hung on the door for the same reason. This is a practice which we share with the Javanese. The placenta is taken by the Dukon Bayi, wrapped in leaves and accompanied with objects to bring good fortune in the baby, to the baby and thrown into the river. This again is a practice we share with the Jap Javanese. The postnatal care provided by the Dukon Bayi included not only giving a bath to the mother and the child, but also doing household chores for 40 days. How did the colonial authorities, the Spaniards and the Dutch, confront the presence of the Hilot and the Dukon Bayi in the native community despite the establishment of a school of midwifery? In the case of the Philippines, the Matrona Titular considered the Hilot as a competitor because the reglamento guiding the practice of midwifery encouraged the licensed midwife to inform colonial authorities of those who are engaged in the practice of child delivery, quote unquote, illegally. The informer or the licensed midwife got half of the fine imposed on a, quote unquote, quack midwife, which amounted to half of 125 pesetas. In 1890, the licensed midwives, in the desire to put an end to the practice of the profession by the intrusas, in Spanish, or the intruders, uh, suggested, this is in reference of the Hilot, suggested that one way of forcing women to avail of the services of the matronas titulares was for the church to require a certification that the child was delivered by a licensed midwife before dispensing the sacrament of baptism. The suggestion was not accepted because the municipal doctor, municipal doctor, and the subdelegate of medicine and surgery of the province of Manila felt that the provision found in Article 14 of the rules governing the matronas titulares sufficed as deterrent against helots or unlicensed midwives. Article 14 reads, the matronas will inform the corresponding authorities about improper machinations carried out by the quacks. The authorities will investigate the person or persons referred to as well as investigate the harm inflicted on pregnant women or fetus. The said authorities will also met out the deserved punishment. 
In the case of the Dutch in the East Indies, with the native population preferring the services of the Duke on Bay, uh, uh, for reasons cited above, the School of Midwifery established in Jakarta in 1851 closed its doors in 1875 after 24 years of existence. It was to reopen only in 1903. In the case of the Philippines, the School of Midwifery continued during the American colonial period. On December 4, 1901, Public Act Number 310 established the Medical Board of Examiners, which functioned as the regulatory board for both medicine and midwifery professions. Dr. Jose Fabella, considered as father of midwifery, established a school of midwifery in 1922 in Manila. The school had three objectives. First, to train women in midwifery, to gradually supplant unlicensed midwives, to train doctors and nurses for provincial work, and third, to give health service and education with emphasis on maternal and child care. As we can see, the helots are still with us. Uh, they're a pervasive force in our society. And uh, I remember very well uh, when um, uh, a French doctor came to the Philippines in the 19th century, he described the helot as ang mabuting helot. So thank you and uh, good morning to all. Uh, maraming salamat po. Um, Mamaluk uh, Kamagay, it's very um, informative, no? especially yung, yung mga um, history ng ating uh, midwife. No? So, so um, naalala ko pa doon sa ano, eh, no? so, papasahin natin yung uh, gunita ng himagsikan ni uh, Emilio Spark ng kanyang ano, no? ng kanyang bayo. So, eventually, Spanish government. Pero karaniwang nangyayari. So, um, uh, sa, ano nyo, sa mga nakita yung documents on uh, matrona titular, kasi very revealing yung mga data, yung information. No? Ano yung mga maaring... Uh, maging um, um, re, uh, possible researches that we can uh, conduct uh, dun sa mga data. Katulad nung parang nakikita ko, parang kasama na rin dyan yung, ano, eh, yung mga yung, yung death, yung mortality, yung, uh, yung family. No? Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah mar marami pa actually buti andito si Ino because all of this came from the archives, no? the, uh, the bundles uh, of uh, the matrona titulares. And there's still much, kasi uh, parang um, uh, this uh, matrona titulares was included in a book of mine on working women of Manila. So it was just really a documentation, but there's still much uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be explored. Uh, like, for example, yung uh, dynamics between the helot and the matrona titular. <laughs> Thank you, you know. <laughs> so it's there in that book. Thank you. Uh, so it uh, there's still much uh, to take a look. Uh, so that's one. Tapos yung, and yung paano, eventually, how was the dynamics resolved? Uh, uh, did, kasi ang alam ko, the helots, were finally um, taught, given training no, by uh, the medical profession. In fact, they were um, said, they were taught, okay, kung wala kang uh, scissors, you uh, uh, disinfect a bamboo to cut the umbilical. So meron naman, ano, parang uh, hindi na sila demonize, parang naging partners. So that's a very good uh, thing to uh, to document, no? Na mula sa being uh, protagonist at magkaaway, paano sila na co-op 
ng medical profession na magiging katulog kasi you cannot naman neglect the needs, the medical needs of native women in the countryside. So kung nandun na rin lang sila at uh, ang malapit sa mga kababaihan, edi ano mo na sila, bigyan mo na lang sila ng training kung paano mapabuti at ma- malayo sa panganib ang buhay ng isang ina. So I think that was that, that one needs to be uh, documented no because uh, eventually during the American period there is a very high infant mortality rate na sinasabi nila ang daming concerns ng mga Amerikano na um, parang pinasulong like they got the de leche I mean child care was something very important the pericultural centers na tinayo nila so I think that one uh, needs to be um, you know you pull that uh, phenomenon of the traditional helot up to the present. In fact, they were also being used to help in family planning projects. No, eh. no? Mm-hmm. So uh, that is one thing that uh, will be an interesting uh, topic to pursue. And uh, I really thank the National Archives. You know, that book which you showed really came from the National Archives. So I'm very, very thankful for the National Archives, no? Thank, Thank you. you very much ma'am, for that very enlightening uh, uh, statement of, uh, of course, um, dadako na tayo dun sa pangatlo na speaker natin, no? Uh, because pinag-uusapan na natin yung documents, eh, no? Sabi nga eh, no document, no history, no? Ito na yung maliwanag na example nun eh, no? So, our next speaker po ay... Uh, Uh, very known author, no? um, especially yung uh, kanyang, sa po, very popular, yung uh, um, Home of Independence. No? Uh, at uh, of course, author din siya ng ibang mga books no? on culture. He's a cultural advocate and um, became a director ng uh, Metropolitan uh, Museum. And now, um, he's the uh, executive director of the Uh, National Archives of the Philippines. So, hindi ko na po pagtatagalin ang kanyang introduction. Of course, uh, um, si uh, uh, Director um, Victorino I, um, Mapa Manalo. Sir, good morning po sa, sa inyo. Uh, good morning. Mor- good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Loud and clear. Great. Yeah, close, okay. Sir. Okay, I'll just share my, I have a PowerPoint to share. Please allow me to share. Malabas ba? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go. So this is um, just, I'm just going to talk on challenges and directions of the National Archives. No, kung... San kami, what are the programs we're advocating? What are our challenges? No, This is an overview of my presentation. Three, basically three parts. No, uh, The first part talks about our mandate and functions. No, We, uh, we are, uh, our, our agency has uh, two, two main uh, directives. No, One is uh, records management. And the, that makes us really the, an, an agency that has to deal with every single government um, government uh, agency in the country, no? Because all government agencies have have um, records, and we uh, initiate uh, protocol with regard to these documents. Uh, <clears throat> in fact. I must say it was really a, a big challenge for me you know, when, when I entered the archives. This is one area that uh, is not very, it's not easy to be familiar with. I, I had some uh, exposure to it. I had exposure to it uh, when I was working for Metro Bank. But uh, this was, of course, very extensive. The requirements were very extensive, which is why I... I took a three-month or a three-month uh, d- uh, diploma course in mm. Hong Kong before I started, no, which I uh, on my own volition. <clears throat> Now, because we are the records manager of the country of all agencies of the country, um, the, you cannot dispose of any public records without NAP approval. 
So if you hear of <coughs> agencies that are throwing away records, you should let us know, no? Because every government record has to be, uh, you have to have permission from the National Archives before you can throw it away, no? Now, uh, but at the same time, we are also a cultural agency, as Dr. Kamagai had had um, mentioned earlier. Uh, we hold the archives and we hold uh, the history, uh, the history, the documents of the history of our country, no? And um, on on, the, on which the history of our country can be based. So, in the sense, we are also a, uh, aside from being a government governance oriented agency we also deal with cultural matters which is why the national archives director sits in the nhcp and in the ncca no so we have basically twin functions in our first function which is records management one of the biggest challenges we had recently was dealing with disasters no when when yolanda struck tacloban and the other parts of uh, in samar and other parts we realized that this was really a, a great need, no, to help um, agencies who lost their who lost their records or whose records were destroyed by fl by flooding, etc. No, so we prepared a disaster recovery team, and we sent them out. But we found out that about even about a month after the disaster, or two two three weeks before after the disaster, people are not even ready to deal with with records. No, they're they are they they get um natutulala no so uh, we found that we really had to come in a little later and we realized no uh, though we do have these workshops now we had to come up with guidelines so we came up with uh, immediate guidelines on what to do with records among them very a very basic one is that uh, you you never dry records under the sun. Everything must be air dried because your records will fade, no? Uh, if you dry them under the sun, uh, so things like that, no? And uh, so we provide the guidelines, and now we're about to come up with the omnibus guidelines for for disaster management. Uh, we stress here records rec recovery and business continuity, no? And in fact, when we do our our trainings now, we do trainings now, no? Um, we we point, we realize that people are not, there's very little that people can do about recovering their records if they're destroyed by flood, etc. We teach them how to properly dispose of them or to request for disposal. But more, more importantly, we stress now disaster preparedness, no? Uh, that's the, our main our main concern now. We go all over the country, we hold workshops. I mean, at least we, we we did before the pandemic. We hold workshops on preparing people uh, for disaster, which which may basically means we teach people how to identify where to keep their records that they are not in the past of flood waters. Uh, very often, records are consigned to the bathroom or to the basement. We tell them that it's not the place for records. And finally, um, we teach them the basic principle that, uh, well, we teach them that one way to prepare for disaster is to duplicate your records, uh, through electro especially through electronic means, because it's now easy to do that or by storing some of your records in other, uh, in other facilities. But most importantly, we even ha have to make people understand the basic principle that never store your record, original records, where your duplicates are stored. You'd be surprised because they're under the same department division. They're uh, sometimes they're stored side by side, which is crazy, no? But even things like that, we really have to bring bring it uh, to put uh, to input that. Now, um, of course, understandably, we are now finalizing the electro electronic records management policy of the country. And here we, we stress the idea of interconnectedness, no? that, that um, agencies should really be preparing themselves to interconnect electronically. No? Uh, we are ongoing with our digitization. Um, 
and uh, it started way back in 1968. In 2021, we will, I hopefully, we will finally finish the digitization of the uh, uh, section two of the Spanish documents of the National Archives. So you were, uh, Manny, you, di ba, binanggit mo kanina na no documents, no archive, uh, no documents, no history. No? Uh, well, that, tam, actually, tama din. No documents, no archives, di ba? Hindi, pero ang idea na um, na uh, we, we uh, when we wrote the hist- when the histories of our country were written only section 1 of our of our records were avail- was available no now so in other words 40% of the holdings of the national archive were not even seen by anyone they were off limits because they had not been cataloged now that they're digitized there are some initial catal- there is some initial cataloging but it's basically um people can now wade through it through electronically no through our our reading rooms so it's really a challenge to start looking at our new record series we've published our i think we have 300 more record series that people can explore and uh, i really hope people will start doing so uh, we'll talk about the challenge of access later on because of the pandemic no okay so, but that's a very important thing that has happened. No? That we have now, after since 1968, we have been doing our digitization and reformatting, and we're now about re- pretty much finished the national. Uh, na actually, in Hindi pa rin, kasi there are still leftover record series that still have to be mopped up. No, okay. <clears throat> now, speaking of no records, no history. Um, I think Manny, it's important importante na ibigyan diin din dito na kung anong klasing dokumento meron ka ganun din ang inyong iyong kasaysayan yung kasaysayan na masusulat no our records our histories as we write them depend on the types of records we have and because of this and because of the principle of inclusion we have come up with a local community archives program where we um, where we uh, uh, um, teach, train uh, small communities, uh, uh, lo- uh, provi- uh, co- communities outside of Metro Manila, but we, we can also do it for Metro Manila, to, uh, to start deciding what records they want to keep, now what, to, uh, what kind of uh, documentation do they want, do they, do they consider important for understanding their daily life? Diba? or the or their existence um right now we well we have had it in mayawyao in in vegan in Nini'i, and finally in jimenez no so we've done northern luzon um visayas in mindanao and we're coming up with a handbook on this no and uh, we introduce here of course the importance of oral history because very often um records what is important for a community on the community level, not the grassroots level, is not recorded. No, it has it, it's, it's oral, so they, it has to be recorded orally. And very often, we also stress that um, that uh, it's important to record um, to document the 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 experiences of women. No, because very often women are not are invisible in in archives. No. Uh, especially because our, an archive like the National Archives of the Philippines contains records that are um, are official or, or of the government, no. Uh, and in fact, uh, and in fact, it's really to some extent it's what's is our, the records that we have are what are are the ones that are left behind. As you know, the archives have suffered many uh, much violence or damage, especially during the Second World War. And kung ano lang yung hindi na, na nagkataon lang hindi ginamit ng ng sundalo bilang unan or bilang bilang pangpunas no or panghigaan kung ano yung nag-escape yun ang record natin so doon na yung ibebase yung history natin so that's why it's important that especially in the community level we find alternate sources of records so we're now working on this 
um, it's one of our uh, more most important programs that we give um, emphasis on, no? Then, um, uh, money, may time pa naman, no? I'd just like to give one example of the importance of community records, no? Uh, pede, money? Yes, sir. Okay, oh. sir. Please, please. Okay. So, I'd like to share the experience we had with the, with the, uh, in the to show you the importance of community archives, community archives. I'd like to share our experience with the church archives of the town of Bulhoon in Cebu, no? Uh, I was I forgot to mention uh, in the past slide. No, what we do very often is we partner with uh, we partner with communities that are associated with national cultural treasures or world heritage sites, like churches. But of course, in terms of Mayaw Yao, it that's also the rice terraces, for example. No, uh, so. Bulhoon is also known for the fact that its church is a national cultural treasure. So we help, we work with the, with the, with the local community and they already had identified important records that they had. Um, and we, we, I, I came up with a lecture which we shared. Now I gave my lecture in the church and I shared it with the, with the people, especially the younger people. And I'm very happy to say that they were very responsive, no? Um, so this this brief section will be about how important church records are and Alex but what's important is that church records must be interpreted in different ways lagi akong sinasabihan na 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 parang nagtatanong bakit ako nasa National Archives na hindi naman ako historian no so parang by idea di ba mani yung idea na pang historian ang ang archives ay para sa mga historian lamang no Meron talagang, meron akong, uh, meron akong, medyo kilalang historiador na lagi yan sinasabi. But, but, um, but what's important is that you also have to remember that archives can be, is for, the archives are for everyone. You can be an economist, you can be a political science, or in my case, you can be an art historian. No? And so when you interpret uh, records from many different points of view, then you the, the the information that you gather the insights that you gather become even richer no the bulhon records date from 1793 which is of course not very not too not too early it has bautismos confirmaciones matrimonios enteros and sen, census no um anong plural ng census censuses sinasabing <laughs> Sensai, <laughs> diba? <laughs> hindi ko alam. Oh, anyway, padrones, mas madali. Yeah. <laughs> so, may, may padrones, no? And that yeah. th this is what they have, no? Now, based on this, are, here are some of the insights you can get, no? When you're working, for example, with inventarios, it can help. Um, there was a little one page where there was a little bit of, there was a little scrap that was folded, really tiny, and I unfolded it, and lo and behold, it gave the date of a painting in the in the baptistry. Now that this painting is attributed to Severino Flavier Pablo, who I think is Manila based, but painted in Cebu, and we now have a definite date for it because of that. No, and I think the date is 17, 1839 or something like that. And um, you can see this beautiful painting. Unfortunately, it's no longer there in the in the church. No, it's been removed, but the retablo is still the frame is still there. No, so that's one example. Uh, you can help the, in in art history. You can help date um, uh, paintings. You can also talk about when you have an an image a uh, piece that is in your collection and it has a date because of the, rec the the local church records you can compare it to objects in the painting for example you notice the similar similarity in design then inventarios also can help you understand words like for example how and and of course the vagaries of spelling at that time bulhoon for example can spell bulhoon with an h bulhoon with a j or sometimes even just bulhoon so the idea of uh, how language changes, no? But recently, I've been more in, I've been interested also in the 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 how inventarios 
can actually talk about i mean i i have this realization that um that i'm toying with is that inventarios help uh, people become familiar no with spanish objects and their vocabulary no they were exposed through spanish objects and rituals uh, and also language and sometimes they would use it for in their own way one example money i'm really interested to think if you to let to, uh, want you to know want to know if you think this is a valid insight um i came upon this this term that a description of a certain um, ob, uh, invent, uh, object in the inventario and it was described as et The, <clears throat> from that term <clears throat> in Etchura de Manila, I realized we have mm -hmm. a term Etchura, diba? Mm -hmm. Etchura mo, Etchura lang, diba? It, it's almost like it's almost said in, you know, in retaliation or mm -hmm. something, no? And then in Ilo at least in Ilonggo, it even gets it even gets shortened to Chura, Chura mo lang, diba? Chura sa bata ni, you know, so. so Maybe because in inventarios, uh, different kinds of etchuras were it was I mean it was a way to under to assign valuation. No, na etchura de Manila was more beautiful or more highly regarded than something that was etchura local or something like that. No, so maybe that somehow got translated na, diba? But. There's even that connotation when you say chura mulang akala mo kung sino you're putting up you're putting on airs so it's something there's something going on there and that might have to do with its usage in inventarios no and uh, even with doodles no uh, the study of doodles also is something very interesting uh, here is kind of drawing <laughs> but siguro some scribe was bored with reading this keeping these documents so this is about tismos and he drew this image of the pomegranate which as you know is an is an image of is is an image used in the passion is an image for for um the passion of christ but it's rooted in an older mytho in an older mythology in greek mythology for example it's related to the idea of uh, of um what is her name Persephone and how she went down into the into Hades but um, but uh, when her mother rescued her it her mother found out that she was forced to come her daughter was still forced to come back because she had eat, eaten a pomegranate no or four sec or three sections of a pomegranate so for three months a year she had to go down into Hades and because of that, there was winter and death throughout the land, no? And it, because of that, uh, but then, you know, after the three months, she she comes out again, the earth is renewed, and it's become, it becomes uh, a um, symbol for, uh, the pomegranate becomes a symbol for the resurrection of Christ, no? And the use of it uh, as, uh, is interesting that it's used in a book of bautismos, no? about birth, about rebirth. So doodles are also something to study. No? And then also there's the many usage of the word, um, of words for textiles. There are all kinds of textiles listed in the, in, uh, in the books and even new terms that I've never come across before, like uh, lompote, I think. Which I finally learned. Uh, I mean, I finally was told about by uh, Sandy Castro Baker. No, uh, so anyway, I'll I'll, I'll go on along. No, uh, but anyway, I wanted to just say how they were copying Chinese. Uh, they may have been copying Chinese fabrics and copying it in the designs even of retablos and altars. I came upon this very strange term, frontales de China. No? dating from 1798 imagine as early as the 18 as in the 18th century and th this is a frontal no? the, the cover of an altar and this is a chinese uh, altar cover a chinese cloth that is known as a tauki and look at how similar they they look no 
And I wonder mm-hmm. if the, that is uh, a related, uh, if that has any meaning. I make this speculation because of the in, because of encountering the phrase frontales de China. Then also, it help, because we have a date for this frontal, which is 1798, it gives us some idea of the introduction of stylistic um, elements like the rokai, of, which means the rococo, and which, which is a um, standard or a uh, important element of the rococo, as the important design element. So the, the, the use of uh, the rokai in 1798 fits in with the... Uh, with, uh, theory of, of, uh, of everyone dating, go, going from Ricky Jose to Martin Tino to Father Javeliana who have diff, uh, who've said that the Rokai only entered the Philippines after 1750. Actually, one said 1750, one said 1780. It was Ricky Jose said, ay nako, second half of the, the 18th century para, para wala nang away. But here is actually a dating of the the use of the rokai, and you can see also the rokai in the different. Um, you see the smaller emblems. No, this is also examples of the asymmetrical rokai. This rokai is from Tanai Church. No. Finally, in this section, I just want to share that we found another, uh, uh, also one of one of the documents that we found dates from 1813. It's the prohibition of the digging up of the bones of the dead. And there, from the way that um, the priest was, it was it's written in Cebuano, and so I had to work on translating it, and uh, <clears throat> which is already interesting, not just the use of Cebuano, and uh, the, it talks about the bishop. It's about the bishop saying that he prohibits digging up the bones of the dead, and uh, so you, you see, no, that this is an old ritual that was still existing even up to 1813, no, so. And he, by the way, he, he talks about punishing the people who are going to continue digging up the bones in their, of the dead because that they are actually uh, continuing a pagan or a ancient ritual, and that they're. They, and he explains that they have to seek uh, forgiveness by going to the center of the of the town near the church, and if they they continue, the bones will be ground up and burned and thrown outside of the town. So in this way, he actually inscribes the geography of the town, no? that uh, he, he situates the, the, the correct practices in the center of the town and practices that were contrary to this or who fell beyond this are beyond the town. And he, de- he therefore uh, actually inscribes the concept of La Ciudad Letrada, no? the idea of the idea of the quadricola, the idea of town planning with uh, the, the use of the checkerboard pattern of streets, the grid system, it actually comes alive in his words. No, You can see that that's the conceptual framework that's behind this, uh, pan- this um, decree of punishment. Then when he talks about the, the practices that are banned, the, the digging of the bones of the dead, he associates it and... We talk about um, Dr. Kamage was talking about the matrona, no? But there were other uh, and how they were demonized. But there were also other groups that were demonized, other practitioners, other holders of ancient knowledge that were practicing uh, that were um, demonized. And he associates uh, associates the bones of the dead with pe- with the tagisakit, with the diwata, and the tagibanwa, no? So he, but because of what he did, because he's, he names these this, uh, practitioners, um, these this holders of, of uh, ancient knowledge, because he names them one by one, we actually get a glimpse. He actually records them. He actually records them for posterity. And he, we actually have a glimpse of the variety of terms, no? So it must mean something that iba-iba to. Bakit iba-iba? Iba-iba yung degree, iba-iba yung specialization. And possibly these are these are women, but they can also be men. No? So tagisakit, diwata, tagibanwa. We all of a sudden have a document that records the terms and therefore saves it for posterity. No? So again, you can see how, how documents in the community level 
can provide things that have of, that are of national importance or importance to many fields from geography to urban design to art history okay now i move on very fast um, we also have trainings uh, uh, workshops now on records management in fa far flung areas areas which are which are have challenges to we call them strategically challenged for uh, tra challenges of transportation communication etc no so Mayawyao, San Jose de Antique, Virac, Catanduanes, Bowak, Marinduque. Sometimes these are also twinned with our community archives program. We have our regular uh, training workshops that are held in the, the main cities of the country. And then we provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with agencies that need it. One of the biggest functions, that one of the most important functions that we fulfill is uh, we hold the records of government agencies so that they don't have to have extensive storage facilities. They, are, uh, they may transfer records to us. And finally, we've been, hold and we've been holding also a national inventory. And we, we had a rollout last year. And of course, nag, nag, nagandahirap tayo this year. No? Hindi, masya, hindi na natuloy yung aming mga plans. Now, we move on to the archival programs. We've been having all kinds of exhibits no? based on our records. So we had Conscription, which is on the records of um, Ilocos and the, ba and the Basi Revolt. We brought, and this exhibit we brought even to Vegan City. So our Ilocos exhibit was op opened in the Met Museum in Manila, but we brought, them, brought it eventually to Vegan City where it was very relevant because um, we were able to reconstruct a model of the pl plaza of Vigan in the 18th or the early 19th century because of records, because we, it was based on records in our holdings. No? And then we, um, we brought it also to uh, the school in Vigan City, and then we brought it to Davao. No? Uh, and uh, here, I want to show you this, no, that... We also work with local craftspeople in making uh, uh, figures, no, tableaus out of clay. No, as you know, Vigan has a pottery uh, is a pottery center, but these these tableaus are based on paintings that we were in the exhibit. No, so as I said, we brought it to Davao and we brought it to Ilocos Norte. Uh, we also had an exhibit on Cebu. And uh, in this exhibit, for example, we had three different kinds, three languages were used, Spanish, English, and uh, Cebuano. And these are some shots of our exhibits. So we incorporate actual objects with, with uh, the archival, uh, with archival images. We've had to expand our, we, for example, we would blow up archival in images. And by the way, what's interesting here is that Manny, natuto na din kami mag, paano mag-exhibit mag ng mga archival materials. Diba? Kasi nga, ang record itself is very is boring. So what do you do to make it more interesting? So we do we even reproduce it in models. We, we blow it up wall size no? and put it on the wall. We, we introduce characters of made out of craft materials like uh, we uh, embroidery. We have mat materials made of, we commission local embroiderers. We commission potters. We commission uh, yung gumagawa ng, yung made of palm leaf, ng mga toys made of palm leaf. These are all to enliven the exhibit. No? Okay. And then, we, uh, th that, but based on the records, we include objects, of course, no? Some of the studies we have, some of the records we've displayed, for example, have insights in urban planning because, for example, it was finally observed that in the middle of Cebu City, there used to be a lake. So, kaya pala binabaha yung area na yan. No? And then we have town plans and building plans. No? I don't know if it's good or bad, but uh, one church that never, that uh, had, was repaired by adding um, a roof, a, a conical roof, no, based on the on the an image in our exhibit. 
we also had, had an exhibit on Cib- on Iloilo. Uh, kasi nga tinatanong ako na lagi na lang daw sa Cebu or sa Ilocos, bakit wala daw sa aking hometown, no? <laughs> so we developed an exhibit in Iloilo. Uh, so these are the images of the Iloilo exhibit here. And one of the most beautiful maps in the in the archive collection was part of this exhibit. This is, uh, but this map is also important for art history because it's a dated map, and there's an example of the use of the rokai, the rokoko rokai, all the way in the 19th century. No? And here are some of the other Im- images that we had. No. Uh, some more images and again no it's a different experience when a document is blown up so that it becomes wall size no our newest exhibit one of our newest and still ongoing is an exhibit on hermano pule which is is integrated into the exhibits of the scudero museum and we had an opening exhibit for the refurbished for the new refurbishment of the negros museum which we also had a uh, a hand in helping them uh, refurbish, no? Uh, so we then we did the, the opening exhibit for the Negros Museum. Our latest exhibit is an exhibit on the Ilocos House, in an in it which is put up in an old Ilocos House in Vigan. It's an exhibit on how Ilocos houses are integrated. Excuse me, arise. Excuse me, arise from their from their uh, environment, the connection of their ho- the houses to the environment, the relation of the house to the street, the, rela- the relation of the house to, a, to the community. No? Uh, our other, uh, 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 out of the exhibits, we come up with publications. We already have two exhibit catalogs. No? And um, we have, up. these are our coming upcoming ex- uh, publications. We're doing a publication on Hermano Pule, the title is The World Embraced by Hermano Pule. Um, uh, then there's going to be a handbook for community archives, uh, a, a bibliography, uh, records in the Philippines in the, in the Mexican archives. And we're going to be publishing the trial records of Pule uh, in, in facsimile form. No? We have other promotional materials, of course, cards, uh, bags, no? Uh, if you like to have bags, let me know. We still have bags <laughs> based on using as a design our records. And we've, we have international cooperation. And one of the activities that we have right now is the copying of Philippine records, record series in uh, abroad. No, Unlike, this is the big difference between us and the NHCP, with, between us and historians, we cannot copy individual records. We need to copy entire record series. That's the difference. That's the biggest difference between archives and libraries. We cannot go and just select what we think is relevant. We must select the entire record series. No? Okay. So that's why it's not that easy for us to just send someone and then uh, scan. We need to have a full agreement with our sister archives abroad. No? As, we, as you know, we are now members of the Southeast Asian Archives, but we're also members of the Latin American Archives, which is why uh, we continue to study Spanish. No, We hold uh, rec... Uh, um, Manny, yung kasama ba natin si, Mr. si Dr. Navarro? That is that the, Is he an archivist? Is he the one that does training on reading records? Um, yes, sir. Um, he's an archivist, no? Yeah, okay. Trained in Spain. <laughs> yeah, trained in Spain. Don't we were trying to get him before to do be one of our lecturers, but he did not push through, no. Anyway, but we've we've had other lecturers on how to read uh records, especially because of the difference in handwriting and spelling, etc. But we also continue to have Spanish classes and we will continue this in the next months, no, to to continue to do Spanish classes. And we're happy to say that every year, napipili lagi ang Philippines to do an exchange, uh, exchange uh, seminar in in Spain, where we 
our people from the Philippines, from the National Archives, stay for one year, one month practicing Spanish. No? Okay. And we will be, we are also doing digitization of uh, and the declaration of national cultural treasures. We started with the UST record by buy-in records and moved on to the, well, we also declared our own collection as a national cultural treasure. And we've moved on to the uh, the records of Nueva Segovia in Vigan, and that has already been declared. And we hope to uh, declare records from Mindanao, the Iwahig records, the Culion records, and the Department of Public Works and Highways collection of plans. It's very important to include um, uh, people who have dis uh, diseases which were dreaded in the past, and also the people from the prisons, because these are people who are often marginalized by society. And again, it's important to say that these are treasures, their records are treasures, as they themselves should be treasured. Okay, uh, so I, I just mentioned it already, the digitization of Nueva Segovia. And finally, the final section of my talk, we're also doing, our, in terms of challenges, we are trying to also to address that idea that archives are only for historians. And uh, I say that just so that people will not think of it that way only. We are doing now workshops on archives and the creative industries. No? How archives can contribute to exhibit design, product design, and even um, uh, tour guiding. No, we will be doing uh, seminars on that. We already did last year a workshop on exhibit design because we've learned so much on how to do exhibits using archival materials that we now are teaching it. And we're going to do an online seminar this month on uh, archives and the exhibit design. This is one of our exhibit designs. No? You can see it's, it, it's a more lively way to pre present archival records. No? And you can also use them as products for mugs, t-shirts, bags, things like that. So how to design with archival uh, material. But our biggest challenge, challenge, of course, is the Intendencia building. Uh, after we had finished all the planning, after we had finished all the, the as we've gotten the budget, it was claimed by another agency. So that's really set us back. The claim issue has now been settled. The, the, the National Archives will be housed in, in the Intendencia. It's been clarified that the Intendencia is for the National Archives. But then we faced another problem, another challenge, which was we were required by our sister agencies to come up with a new conservation plan. Imagine my conservation plan na kami, naggawa pa ng bago, meron na kami archaeological survey, nag, nag, we were required to have another one. And rather than challenge our agencies, we we faced the challenge and we took it on and we did it. We 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 now commissioned archaeological surveys and a new conservation management plan. But unfortunately, natamaan kami ng pandemic. So we've just, just the other day, last week, we finally finished the new conservation management plan. And I'm very happy to, to share with you that it's really been clarified that the Intendencia is one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful buildings of the Spanish era. And that um, much of its design, and that its design is actually based on the golden mean. Talagang gina, because of it's the it's really a, a jewel of the neo neo neoclassical uh, iconography of neoclassical language, and you can see that every part of it corresponds to the greater whole through the through the what we know as the Fibonacci series, no, uh, the, the, or the golden mean. Uh, the archaeological survey is just about to begin because it's been so hard to really put the team together because of the pandemic. And they're going to be finished in a month. And we hope that we will finally be able to... We, that now, based on all of this, we still have to do a new plan. So imagine we already had the plan, but now we have to make a new plan. But sige lang, we're going to... This is going to... Kahit mahirap. Excuse me. It's, this is something we're going to finish, no? Okay. <clears throat> Another aspect is the expansion plan. No? We have to expand the National Arch Archives so that it will really have a national coverage. For example, you can see Thailand 
um, Thailand has uh, nine uh, archives or ten archives, and it's a country that's just about as large as us, and we are even larger in terms of population. They even have a special archives just for the current for the uh, jubilee of the king, no. So we are, whereas we only have a Cebu branch and a Davao branch. So we're going to have to expand maybe to Tarlac, Mulacan, Lucena, Iloilo, Cagayan de Oro, and Sambuanga. No, and probably somewhere in northern Luzon. So, and aside from that, we're going to have to have state-of-the-art facilities and additional plantilla positions. Can you imagine we are servicing the entire country with just three offices? No, so it's not been easy. Uh, what, what uh, I know, uh, as part of this expansion plan, we finally have an uh, uh, a warehouse outside the Metro Manila in Silang, Cavite. Or actually, I'm sorry, in Dasmarinas, Cavite. And we're finally buying a new building. By the way, we finally own our own building. We have a, a, a new building in Otis that we're using for special special collections, but the headquarters will be in, in the Intendencia in, in, in Tremuros. We're finally buying, uh, I think by this month it will be concluded, the Mindanao Record Center in Davao. And um, we are working on our new storage facilities all over. Uh, there, there's also going to be a storage facility in Davao, separate from the, cent the archive center, the record center. What are their challenges because of the pandemic? And the, con, uh, the need, and the need to convert con, to convert everything to the electronic and virtual delivery, uh, we we had to do a training we, uh, on how to work with visual with the virtual format, no? How to deliver services in the, in the with the virtual format. Hindi lang kasi pwede na virtually delivered, pero actually hindi naman na deliver di ba service. Kailangan talaga na deliver. We have to migrate all our seminars. Ah, by the way, ah, very often people are just expected to con to migrate, to convert to digital formats. And it's not easily done. You need to be trained to do that. So we're doing that first. And then we're having we're migrating our seminars. And we even have the virtual tour of exhibits. No? And then we are uploading some of our record series. We're starting with the Erecciones, and we now have the document of the month. We do individual documents, but we will be uploading entire record series. Um, we're trans the biggest, our biggest uh, challenge is the reading room. For the longest time, sinabi na we were close, actually hindi. But ngayon, we have the policy now that we, people are not allowed to touch, to handle uh, original records. And that makes things complicated. And this is because we, we were trying our, in the past, we had the losses of records. And then there was also the destruction of records because of handling. No, they are much more brittle now than they were than when, um, when uh, they're much more brittle now than when these books were written. This, for example, and this. French consular dispatches, and of course, Mr. Calairo. I don't have a book by Dr. Navarro, so I have. I should show one eventually. But anyway, they were now they're even more brittle, so that's part of it. But now, for so for the longest time, we could uh, you our policy was that um, most of our records are now digitized, so we serve the digital records. But if you, um, if only by in, under cer certain special circumstances, do we allow the originals to be to be served? And you, if they are not digitized, we need a week to digitize them for you. No. However, because of the pandemic, we can no longer uh, um, we can no longer use our reading room. By the way, this is only a temporary reading room because, as you know. We had to vacate the National Library. So we, we are a refugee agency. We had to seek refuge in Paco and uh, in our Paco office. And it's very small, the reading room there. So we can no longer accommodate people because of social distancing issues. So everything now is through email. No? And we will do our best to continue delivery of uh, research materials through email. No? Uh, at the same time, we're also 
doing uh, doing uh, giving guidelines on reworking the way we handle documents in the time of pandemic, how we work with messengers, how we do, and also that we have to encourage everyone to shift to electronic records so that they can, so that they less to lessen contact. Very often, our many of our sister agencies think that a digital digitized signature is an electronic signature. We have had to. It's one of our advocacies to explain to people that digitized uh, electronic signatures are signatures that have a password, no. And you cannot just. It's not just a question of scanning your signature and attaching it to a record, no. So things like this. These are new protocol that people will have to learn. Nevertheless, we also point out, we are also working, uh, we also like to point out that there are new, many good things happening. We are coming up with, a, we have launched a pandemic responses archives workshop uh, um, initiative. This is together with the Southeast Asian archives, where we now are keeping the documents related to um to the pandemic, how agencies respond to the pandemic, because we understand that what is happening to us is history. No? Mm -hmm. That someday, this, many people are going to be looking back into what uh, what is happening now and how we responded. No, and in fact, uh, our world is going to change. Our world is changing, and it will not be the same world that we go back to. So it's important that when we that we will be dealing with eventually after the after in the in the coming years, and so these changes are happening. These changes are happening now, and we're we're trying our best to gather the evidences of these changes and these responses for our archives that the future generations will use. Lastly, um, we are working on a revised on revising the law of the National Archives, we are hoping to elevate the National Archives into a National Archives and Record, Records Management Authority, NARMA. That will, of course, mean we will work, we will have to work with our legislators to, so that it will be stronger and more fit to face the future. Uh, what's nice about the acronym of the National Archives and Records Management Agency uh, it, authority, I'm sorry, it will be the National Archives and Records Management Authority. What's good about the acronym is that we can use, we can come up with a slogan, Sabi ng NARMA, pag hindi mo ayusin ang iyong records, ikaw ay makakarma. No? So, uh, so that's an idea. No? Anyway, but speaking of slogans, um, uh, this is our slogan, uh, one of our recent slogans, Pag, hinamon, pag hinahamon, dapat bubangon. Um, we, we had the idea that um, somebody had, originally one of the suggestions was, Pag may hamon, dapat bumangon. But then I said, baka naman parang almusal yan, kay pag may hamon, dapat bumangon. Bangon ka na, may, may hamon. <laughs> diba? But uh, we now have this idea, this slogan, Pag Pag hinahamon, dapat bumangon. And I think the, reason, the one reason that I can say that this is true or this is appropriate is our, I've seen our agency adopt, no? even the older members of our agency, people adapt to, to what's happening. Um, uh, do you realize that last year, I, uh, this is the first time I've ever, I mean, this is the first year I've been part of uh, virtual seminars. Everybody, it's now natural for us to say, wedding mag share, and that this means that we're sharing records or doc, uh, presentations, and uh, or nakamute ka, di ba? We, we never. This was not part of our language last mm -hmm. year, but we. But you see, everybody, uh, even that's why it's very inspiring for me to see uh, uh, people. Uh, our, our our forebears or our our or our um, people who've gone who have worked who've uh, blazed new paths for us like Dr. Kamagai that they're here they're adapting they're using new technologies no and so if we can do that if an agent if every if um, everyone in an agency can do that alam ko na talagang pag may pag may hinaham pag hinahamon dapat bumangon thank you.
Oh, maraming salamat po, uh, Director uh, Ino Manalo. Napaka-informative ano, ng inyong uh, presentation. Actually, marami na nag-message sa akin. Eh, no? Pero iisa lang yung laging natanong nila. Eh, kasi katulad ko may mga researchers, uh, pagbaba ka sa community, no? minsan meron kang may encounter na, ano, eh, na mga documents na katulad na nasa archives mga 19th century. Uh, ako personally, uh, Uh, mayroon akong nakita na ano na inakit, inakit na bahay talaga. Eh, no? <laughs> Tapos merong puon, no? sa puon na yun sa ilalim, merong uh, parang ba? Ano, parang cabinet. Pagbukas ko na ganyan, it's a, it's a document. No? Pero 19th century document, actually ano pa, related sa sa personalities ng revolution. Pero ang tanong nga doon, ano ba yung awareness ng family about that? No? Yung ba, itatag sa nila? Yung ba ay... Uh, Kaya yun siguro yung palaging tanong ng ating community. No? Uh, ano ang may advice ninyo dun sa mga ganong uh, uh, pamilya na mga merong record no? na sila ba ay makikipag-coordinate sa inyo? O meron ba kayong handbook on that? Sabi, yeah, uh, we are just about to come up with our, our hand, uh, medyo natagalan na to, our handbook on community archives. no But by all means, Um, we'd be happy to we, we we definitely coordinate with people when they tell us that they have records no talaga namang nagkakaroon talaga ng records na hindi lang official records ng government no meron din sa in the grassroots records for example like the ownership of carabaos the ownership of land no may mga records din yan and um and tinatago minsan yan sa tubo ng kawayan mm-hmm. for example no And so it's important that uh, one of the first things they do is, of course, document it or du- uh, duplicate it by taking a picture. Ngayon na, di ba, may mga marami namang ngayong may cellphone. Take a picture with your cellphone. You can send it to us. Or And if there it's really a significant set of records, we will coordinate about uh, about what to do with them. No? Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things also we're launching is a photographic archive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what we will we want to do a, a photography of a photograph drive in different com- in communities that will be part of our community archives initiative. So. Thank you, sir. So another ano, ano, uh, question related to the presentation kanina kasi yung uh, about the galleon and trans pacific exchanges and even yung kay Dr. Kamagay no about uh, mm. uh, Matrona titular no kasi um, abroad na banggit niya rin kanina no na we are engaged for example sa sa Archivo General de la Nacion sa sa um, Archivo Civil sa ma, sa ma, Spain no? so mm. yung ba mga ganun ay um, available na rin sa atin uh, sa, sa inyo sa archives na pwedeng i-access ng mga Pilipino. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, we are we already right now we already have the holdings of the uh, Biblioteca Nacional of Mexico uh, that was as arranged by them our, our sister agency the Mexican National Archives or AGN. Uh, we we, uh, we were able to um, uh, what is this to digitize the the collection of the Franciscans in Mexico. No, so that's part that's part now that's available in our reading rooms. Now the thing is uh, actually uh, uh, our agreement, di ba kasi wala pang COVID noon eh? So our agreement is that they ha- they can only be accessed in our reading rooms. No. Mm-hmm. So we have not been they're not accessible through the internet, no? Uh, you cannot do it through our website. But as I said, we're launching the Erecciones, which is the most used of our records that will be now digitally available. And we've also been doing other um we also doing other record series with AGN. This year, we're also going to we're already about to start our digitization of Spanish archives, no? Um, and eventually we hope to do all the all the I mean strategic or selected record series from Spanish uh, religious orders no mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I, I was saying na uh, uh, when you said launching the uh, erection de Pueblos in the digitized form it will be made available through your website yes okay? yes that's our goal mm-hmm. no? 
malaking tulong po yan sa ating mga kababayan. Kasi marami actually mga issues ang mga local government about town foundation. Eh. Sa town oh, town. Uh, I just want to explain something no, na medyo natatagalad kami. Kasi do you, do I hope you people understand na, uh, na we have had to move about nine times. I have had to move office nine times. No, So it's really hirap. I mean, you, diba, yung inayos na namin yung reading room, lilipat na naman, di ba? But it's, uh, wala eh, kasi nakikisama kami sa aming mga sister agencies at nakikisama rin sila sa amin. No? Um, of course, we've had all kinds of experiences, pero sige lang. Mahirap, pero sige lang. We will do it, no? And okay. kaya medyo natatagalan kami sa launching ng elektsyones, etc. It takes us uh, quite a bit of time, no? Uh, okay, sir. Sir, yung about ano, yung sinasabi niyong community archives, ina-applyan po ba yun from the local level or... Uh, Uh, well, I did, I, 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 yeah, they can, of course, no. But we will evaluate it based on their readiness. Well, mm-hmm. of course, it's, it's some to some extent, it's on hold, no, because mm-hmm. of the pandemic. But when it before the pandemic, uh, what it really entails is many workshops. Hindi lang isa, no. Introductory, then 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 after that, mag data gathering na so second workshop and then pinapasukan din namin ng records management so mga at least three workshops no so it's a long engagement it's a it's a invested engagement no and uh, but hopefully uh, in the in the i mean so to some extent roll out yung ginagawa namin pilot uh, projects no and then based on this we've coming out with a handbook uh, and then we will um, Hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, they can already replicate the workshop based on the handbook, no? But it's we're still willing to consider other pilot areas for this. Now we would like to do another an urban area. Now we're thinking either of maybe Malibay. We can do Cavite if you if you think uh, that. bang binanggit mo lang kanina na na yung kayo ang Cavite City is the Latin City no and natabunan na yon na sa Buanga natabunan sa Buanga ba i mean yun ang yun ang i mean tinatawag na sa Latin City ang sa Buanga uh, ngunit masasabi mo din na ganun din ang ang Cavite parang ganun ang sinabi niyo no um, I, i would be very interested in doing that because you know sometimes in towns where the the heritage infrastructure has been destroyed It's the there's still things that can be gathered from oral histories, di ba? Na sometimes these are na lang the records that can be generated, mm-hmm. no? And it's important to do that. Mm-hmm. No? Sir, last ano lang comment yun na lang, kasi may mga nagsasabi na ang mga documents daw sa archives ay uh, Spanish perspective. Ano yung masasabi niyo tungkol diyan? Uh, totoo yan. Well, kahit anong record naman may 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 nakasaad ka agad may nakasalalay ka agad na perspective yon kasi nga hindi naman pwedeng gawin ng record ng 300 people at the same time di ba so more or less isa lang yung author halos niyan uh, pero number one, nasa nasa pag-interpret na yon kaya nga sabi ko hindi lang dapat pang historian ng archives pero pa, pa, pang art historian pang geographer pang economics pang etc. So, pag iba-iba yung perspektiba, iba din na lalalapas, di ba? At kung aware ka na the issue of of the uh, aware ka sa tinatawag na discourse that produced a document, then aware ka on how to deconstruct it or how paano mo maunawaan. Pero also, this is also why we are uh, having these community archives workshops so that the the rec- some of the, the records that are going to be uh, kept are from the grassroots and are selected by the community themselves the community members themselves and it, in, it, it can it and archives then will include materials like um, recipes women's histories women's experience and all other uh, so called minority groups no thank you very much sir no malaking bagay talaga yan no uh, Uh, social history ganga you know that brings us to the another uh, uh, discussion kay uh, Dr. Kamagay kasi si ang focus ni Ma'am ay talaga ano eh French historiography para sa social uh, history 
Yeah. Pero pam ano yon na uh, when you did the ano the uh, archival research no uh, siguro para lamang dun sa mga nanonood sa atin ano yung mga challenges hurdles na na experience nyo in reading the documents no kasi ang uh, dami na sabi pupunta ako sa archives mo sa akong document no o ano uh, pa photocopy ako ganun so ano ba yung mga karaniwang uh, na experience yun? as a uh, authority in uh, archival research doing the do- documents no On yes, women, okay. no? Yes, uh, Actually, alam mo, ang akin pasasalamatan ng malaki ay yung mga sigareras. Hmm. Kung hindi ko sila nadiskubre sa Espanya, kasi meron document doon yung ligaho or bundle na uh, alboroto di sigareras de Manila, hindi ako, hindi mamumulat ako sa, ano, sa kababaihan. Kasi, um, Actually, yung Alborotos de Cigarreras de Manila na bundle na kita ko sa, sa Madrid ay tungkol sa isang welga. Pero komo lalaki yung nagre-record, parang dinownplay na ito ay isang tantrum or alboroto, a small uh, uh, uprising, something like that. Pero sa katotohanan siya ay isang welga ng mga babae na nagtatrabaho sa uh, ano sa pabrika ni Tabacos. Mm-hmm. So um, I remember that when I finished my PhD in France, I spent one whole summer in the archives trying to know more about the cigarreras kasi wala rin akong alam tungkol sa kanila. So ang natatandaan ko Uh, may may kota na pwede kang i, uh, i-request no sa archives noon i think three bundles a day parang yun yung natatandaan ko so three bundles a day at um, may araw na kasi for the cigarreras you have to take a look at the tobacco manila kasi maraming tobacco bundles. So you have to focus on the, the Manila, tobacco Manila bundles kasi yung mga pabrika ng tobacco ay ayan dito sa Manila. So may araw na when you consult your three bundle cot, three bundles kota, wala, hindi mo mak- sila makikita. Talagang tapos may araw naman para sila they were jumping out of the pages, ang dami-dami. So it really gave me a high. Wow, ang sarap basahin no so um uh, that whole summer when i spent uh, which i spent in the national archives wala pang traffic noon so araw-araw pumunta ako sa archives uh, re- the end product of that research was an article on the cigarreras no so enjoy na enjoy ako sa national archives you know i was really So happy to discover the women. I mean, uh, siguro, I mean, andun sila, pero it has it has to take a woman to really unearth them and select the bundles where they appear. So mm-hmm. I was, um, after the article on the cigarreras, which came out in Philippine Studies noon, karoon ako ng lakas ng loob na sabi ko, mag-apply kaya ako sa UP ng isang research project Uh, on working women. So balik na naman ako sa archives at doon ko na tinignan na talaga yung mga matron titulares, yung mga uh, mestras, pati mga mujer publikas, yung mga prostitutes. So that was what really inspired me to take a look uh, on uh, in at women's history. So thank you Ino. Of course you were not still the 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 mm, wala pa. Wala ka pa. Hindi pa ako nasin. pinapanganak. Wag <laughs> <laughs> mo naman ako patandain sa to. <laughs> Pero uh, uh, I really appreciated the National Archives. It really was a mine of information for me. Mm-hmm. Huh? So uh, I'm happy that you're moving in uh, many directions making the archives now a very friendly user friendly institution and uh, uh, good luck to uh, your move to the intendencia I really commiserate with you you have been like refugees moving from one building to the other but uh, 
I hope I'm still alive when I see you move in <laughs> in the Intendencia building. Mm -hmm. Now, I have just a question, Eno. How open would be the archives on, uh, you know, keeping also oral history? No, no, that's... We, uh, we, materials. Plan, to, we plan to generate more oral histories uh -oh. no? through our workshops. Okay. No? Uh oh, yeah. Kasi because that, uh, that way they, they 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 you don't just deal with official paper records, right? Mm -mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, correct, correct. Oh, I just want to say though that uh, okay, Mister. Hi. Okay, no, no, I just wanted to say something like to uh, you know. Well, um, uh, I remember we we were in the, we were teaching the department of humanities. I was in the history department, but we just greeted each other so. <laughs> But uh, when I came back from Spain, we got to meet at the archives uh, years ago. But I just want to comment that, well, I'm very happy that this is what is uh, uh, with um, what you're doing at the archives, really uh, very happy. You know, I've always looked at the archives as the soul of our nation. You know, it is where uh, the, our, the heart of our nation is found and it's treasured. And, you know, I'm looking forward to all this activities and you know these things especially the the intendential building finally having a home for the archives okay so uh, wishing you all the best on that okay thank you very much thank you thank you thank you sir uh, chas actually uh, uh, ano eh ah uh, to para kay sir inrin to no uh, gusto ko lang ibalik yung panahon na nagre-research ako sa archives tinan ko kung yun pa rin ba siya ngayon kayo na bahala ng mag-comment kasi tanda-tanda ako no titila ako sa labas ng archives no? Alas 8. Tapos papapasokin na si, si Ma'am Rowena na pa noon eh. No, uh, <laughs> sa, tapos, re-request na kayong sa papel ng, ano, no, ng uh, ilang bundle yon At ibababa yun sa pamamagitan ng pang sobrings na dala. Na, yung mga dokumento talaga. No? Uh, yun yung mga panahon nyo, mga 1990s. Eh, no? Tapos uh, bubuksan mo yon no? Minsan nga, hindi pa nga wala pang gloves pa noon. No? At uh, ang daming... Siguro during that time, uh, sa isang araw, kaya mga pagbukas ng mga hanggang sampu eh, kung mabilis ka magbasa. No? Kasi yung iba naman, ang tinitingnan lang yung heading, hindi naman binabasa yung buong dokumento. No? So, nandiyan na yung eh, binabahing ka dahil nga nakikita mga silver uh, worm. No? At um, ayun, um, maghapon talaga na, minsan naman maghapon, wala ka talagang makita. No? Kasi kung ano nakalagay doon sa heading, hindi naman siya yung nakalagay sa loob. No? So yung yung ganun na pero tama si Dr. Kamagay. Although after a week of uh, no document, mamaya bigang meron na nakita na isa, talagang mapapatalo ka talaga sa saya eh, no? So kung po bang ganung experience ay uh, pwede pa ring maranasan ng isang researcher na yun, uh, given na yung um, Okay. Unang-una, pag tumatalon ka sa loob ng archives, pinapali pinapalabas ka. <laughs> Hindi na <laughs> <laughs> Hindi namin tinatolerate yung mga tumatalon-talon. <laughs> but actually, uh, th these things, this is what keeps me up awake, uh, keeps me up at night, keeps me awake at night. Kasi right now, we cannot serve people the way we used to serve them. no? Because uh, we are really constrained by our uh, our physical situation. No? We, we, as I said, uh, it's not only that when we when we were asked when we were forced to leave the library that we had to um, th that uh, we not, we were, we moved into smaller a smaller reading room a temporary smaller temporary reading room but it's also the situation that our we no longer have the records and the reading room in the same building mm -hmm. no which is why we have this we had to, we were forced to serve records digitally so, ang problema ngayon ay, in fact, I really, talagang, it really worries me because, syempre, uh, mas, mas mabagal na ngayon no? because we have to, you, you, we, will, you, we need to check if the records are, are digitized before we can serve it to you. And if they're not digitized, we have to digitize it for you. The good thing is that now that they're digitized, uh, talagang you can continue and continue look, looking for things uh, na halos as, as much as you want. No? Also, um, of course, ma mahirap talaga. No? There, uh, right now, the, 
but what's good is we now have the Spanish documents section two. Now there's all kinds of things about uh, there. I wish people would start really start using them. Kaya lang nga nag pandemic na naman so hindi naman magamit yung aming reading rooms, no. But uh, what's important is that um and the is that you can find all kinds of things. Just to let you know, huh? for example in the um in a record series, there's a record series in the section 2 called Ar called archery. I forgot the term in in Spanish, but it's about archery. Huh? About I'm archery. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, but when we opened it, we found that there's a 1935 report on the elections in the Spanish in the American period. So that's one of the few records we have from the American period. No, but may nakahalo na ganun, no? So but there's all kinds of other things. We've just found records on Mindanao that has ne that have never been seen before. And we've now put them out in a small exhibit, uh, things like that. So there's so much to to see, but but unfortunately, it has all now. I mean, it's a bit constrained now. It's been constricted a bit because of the. We now have to use email. You have to just email us, email us, and we will respond with the, with, the, with the, your records request. Thank you very much, sir. Siguro talaga ano yan? It's about the preservation thing, no? Uh, mm -hmm. We're moving forward. No? So, siguro, we're running out of time. No? So, before I uh, um, ask the uh, the final note of, of everyone, siguro, ask us to si serve uh, Chas. Sir, yung, ano, um, yung Trans-Pacific Exchange, no? so, sabi nga natin, uh, 333 years under the Spanish rule, then meron pa yung Mexican uh, ano, no? uh, cultural uh, exchange then. No? So, sa, sa Philippine uh, historiography, uh, based on your uh, studies, um, mala malawak na ba yung study about the div uh, no, parang studies about Mexican co contribution to the Philippine culture and the uh, Spanish contribution to the Philippine culture? Kasi parang pag sinabi kasi nga 333 years, lumilita ba yun? Basically, Spanish lang palagi eh. Kast Influensyang Castilla yan eh. Pero nung dumating na itong uh, panahon ng galion, 250 years, um, hmm. Marami ba tayo mga pag-aaral na ito na ihiwalay natin ano ba yung Mexico at ano ba yung Espanya? Well, you know, kasi lumalabas uh, for, well, since uh, since around 2013-14, you know, the, Mexic, uh, the Mexican government and also yung mga academic institutions have been also doing their own conferences on the galleon, ano? Kasi emphasizing the Manila Acapulco Pike, no? Manila Acapulco Pike. While in Spain, you have the emphasis on the galleon trade, of course, between Seville and Seville, Spain, and that with Mexico, and from Mexico to that of the Philippines, no? So, mas malawak, okay? Mas malawak. Um, uh, for example, as I mentioned earlier, no? This past few weeks, no? Uh, I think a week or so, there have been conferences... Sponsored by the Mexican Embassy, you know, webinars, and then also by the Spasi on the on the, the general status of the Manila Garden Trade, you know, what uh, what went uh, what went with the Garden Trade, you know, that is from Spain to the Philippines. Mexico, naman, they were more in interested in Mexican influence, especially food, spices that would be flowing from Mexico to here. But you know, in you know, in general, actually, we have to look at it that as a as the galleon trade in general, because from Manila to Acapulco, they go by the land to Veracruz to on the other side, mm -hmm. the same product. So, singa, malawak pa, wala pang pana makanal nun eh. Mm -hmm. So, they have to go all the way down, if ever, and cross, no? Go well, through the Magellan Strait. So, they have to take it uh, overland and then transfer it to a ship where it will pass to Cuba. And then from Cuba, it will go to, to Seville, to Sevilla. That's why, uh, I mentioned earlier the, the Cuban mango, the mango Filipino. That's so in reality, that's how the mango traveled from Manila to Acapulco, Acapulco to Veracruz, Veracruz to Cuba, and then from Cuba uh, all the way up now, okay, to Sevilla. But of course, yung 
mangrove Filipino, it doesn't exist in Spain, but it only exists in Cuba. So whatever happened to it between its travel from from Cuba to to Sevilla, baka baka hindi na umabot, no? baka, baka it was, kasi they have their own version there, the mango naman coming from the northern part of Africa. So from the Moroccan area, no, northern Africa. So, well, these products also, they had to, nag-meet din sila, they had to meet with competition then. Mm-hmm. So that's why uh, these are two major points, eh, the Spanish and the Mexicans. Okay, that's why if you look at the our history, you have to look at it also from uh, like Spanish culture seeping through Mexico to us. That's why people would say now we're more Mexican now than Spanish. Mm-hmm. Yung mga expressions na ganun because our being Hispanic was more through Mexico than directly. Mm-hmm. When they lost the con, when they lost the colonies in the 1820s, 1830s, when direct rule over the Philippines was now established, of course, by that time, you can, uh, Spanish influence had been established already in the country. So whatever was here was already, was already established. So still, okay, we cannot deny the fact that Mexico had played a very important role mm-hmm. sa ating history. That's why in, in Chabacanon, uh, sinasabi kasi nga, there are two words. Eh. Narinig nila, platica, platica, es, platica espanol, platica, no? Kasi platica in Spanish Mexico is to speak. Mm-hmm. Platica. Eh, sa, sa Chabacano, they say platica, platica. Sa, sa Spain naman, habla. Habla espanol, no? habla castellano. Ganun. So you see, you may get mo ng how strong the influence was. So, Actually, mas malakas pa nga yung Mexican influence. <laughs> Kasi nga, everyone came from Mexico. Yeah, we have to assess. Even the, the workers, that's why. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kaya, yan ang ano, the Mexico. Okay. Sir, ano, uh, final yes. note na lang siguro. Okay. Uh, Sir Francis, a very brief note lang for our audience. Final note. Ah, a fi- ah final words. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I would say now, well, uh, when, well, yung, uh, the history of the garden trade in the Philippines, the Manila Capulco garden trade is something that we should be proud of. Okay, it does not necessarily mean uh, that the garden trade, although it has its negative and positive effects, should be put aside. But we should recognize the fact that uh, our being Hispanic, our being Hispanic, came through came through these ships that crossed the Pacific. Although they came whether from Spain via Mexico, and then from Mexico from the other parts of the empire, like you no know, Mula Peru. Kasi pagdating sa Mexico, from Peru pa yun, eh, from Ecuador, no? these places, talagang uh, it was a big exchange. We should recognize that we are part and parcel also of the history of the Pacific. That our relationship with Latin America or South America okay, cannot be denied na dapat actually we should maintain it. Okay. So, Anna, so, Maybe the same status as that of Spain and, uh, and that's that of Spain, but still, it is something that we have to uh, we have to keep. Okay. Thank you. 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 Oh, yes. Na-trace na, na so, daw niya dito. If uh, yung itong Argentina niya na, na, na-trace niya dito. Nasa San Juan daw yata. Eh. Nakatira pa sa San Juan. San Juan okay. Rizal. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Sir Chas. Uh, uh, Dr. Kamagay, uh, final words for uh, audience. Uh, ano po? <laughs> okay. Um, siguro my uh, uh, last words will be really to encourage historians and women historians to, you know, uh, al- uh, make women part of the historical narrative. For a long time, 
uh, women have been marginalized or invisible, which is true. And uh, it's about time that we, um, you know, make them part of the historical narrative. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kamagay. Uh, talagang dapat talaga mapag-aralan ng mga marginalized sectors no, our society. Um, there are, you know, uh, any words from our audience, uh, especially you gusto mag-research archives. <laughs> uh, uh, well, kanina may, may, binang, may nagpanggit na <clears throat> na yung perspective na nakasala, nakasa, nakasalalay sa mga documents no, na minsan foreign, etc. Pero na, masasabi ko na nasa tao na yan na gumagamit nitong mga records. Mm -hmm. no? Merong isang famous example ng yung tinatawag natin, yung multi-volume work na ginawa ng mga Frances sa ilalim ni Napoleon. Yung tinatawag natin, the, 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 what is it? The, the description of, of Egypt. Ano yun sa Frances? Uh, the, the? Description, the, the description of Egypt. The description uh, of Egypt. The Egypt. The Egypt. Yeah. So, uh, these are a series of records and books and documentation of what Egypt was all about, no? That was made by the by the French, obviously with the French um, bias, but it is now used as documentation of it is now a important documentation of Egypt as it was in in uh, the, in the past, but also it was used by Edward Said as the basis for the development of one of the important sources for his development of his theory of Orientalism, which is a uh, which is a uh, important theory now that uh, we that uh, we use in cultural studies, and in that we use in deconstructing the deconstructing the hegemony, the stranglehold of Western influence on our ways of thinking. No, so you can see something came out of it that put that made things turn around, and um, this is also why because of precisely of theories like Orientalism. This eventually gave rise to um, other ways of thinking, and this gave rise to the idea of inclusion. and uh, And you can see that this this is this principle is very important to us, and that this is why we, we are working on community archives as a way to come up with so that uh, so that communities can decide what records they want that to, to represent themselves. Mm -hmm. in the right that people will use in the future for 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 um for the writing of history and for other things <laughs> finally um i want to ask everyone's uh sigo kung pwede lang sana konting pasensya lang mm -hmm. kasi medyo mahirap ang amin situation because as you know we, we for the longest time we were the only archive left in southeast asia that did not have its own building ngayon malapit na but right now we medyo mahirap talaga yung aming service delivery dahil sa sitwasyon na to um, but we will do our best to meet your demands we will do our best we will do our best to work to do our to work for you and inuulit ko yung aming aming panawagan ngayon lalo na sa panahon ng pandemya uh, pag may pag hinahamon dapat bunga, bumangon salamat po Marami po salamat, Sir Ino. Marami po salamat sa lahat. At uh, papadala lang po namin mga certificates ninyo, no? At para sa ating mga audience, yung mga gusto makakuha ng e-certificate, you could log on sa NQC portal, no? Ayan, napakita na yung doctor. <laughs> oh, ito. Salamat, salamat. Salamat po. At, um, okay. Uh, yun po. Uh, oh, dito, yeah. Do, Mr. Navarro, kailangan may libro din ako ng libro mo, ha? <laughs> para mapakita ko din next time. Thesis <laughs> ko. Sige. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. So, um, ito po ulit ay uh, well, uh, project ng uh, National Historical Commission of the Philippines in collaboration with the Cavite Study Center and various agencies like NCCA, uh, Kabansa, the Philippine Historical Association, we have the president, then Center for Talakenyo Studies, Palawan Study Center, Pagor Historical Society, and uh, Cavite Historical Society, in solidarity, of course, with the 2021 King Centennial Commemorations in the Philippines. No? 
collective victory and humanity. So with that, abangan niyo po ang susunod nating webinar. Focus naman sa uh, pop culture. So with that, maraming maraming salamat po. Stay safe and uh, uh, mag-ingat po lagi, tayo po lagi. Mabuhay tayo lahat. Bye-bye. Padayon, padayon. Damo git salamat. Salamat. <laughs>